This meeting is being recorded. We're recording. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. It is November 4th, 2024. While this is a regular meeting of the town council, it is also a meeting of the budget coordinating group, which includes all school committee members from the town of Amherst. Well, it includes tonight at our meeting, all school committee members, Jones Library trustees and finance committee members who are able to attend. If there is a quorum of those bodies present and we have determined that there is, I will ask you to call your meeting to order in just a moment. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. However, there is a quorum of the council physically present in the town room and on the screen. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media, Channel 9, and live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the November 4th regular town council meeting to order at 6.04. I'll call upon each councilor by name. They have indicated they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. Please remember to then mute your mic again. A point of order, This is, you're calling the special meeting to order, not the regular meeting, correct? I'm calling on both to order. Okay. Okay. So um, thank you for reminding me that. So it is calling both meetings to order. Meeting. Point of order. Yes. Isn't the regular meeting noticed for 630? So it can't be called to order yet? It's uh, noticed for seven. It's for seven. Thank you. Just so I can't. Special. I'm calling the special meeting to order. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go start with the counselors. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmers. Present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord. Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here, but Zoom is still loading. Okay. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. And Councillor Walker. Here. Sarah Marshall, will you please call the Amherst School Committee to order and ask the people can be heard, that you can hear and be heard. Thank you. Seeing the presence of a quorum, I call the Amherst School Committee to order. I will call on each uh, committee member to say they are present so we can hear you and I know you hear us. Deb Leonard. Here. Jennifer Shaw. Present. Bridget Hines. Present. Irv Rhodes. Present. Thank you. And yourself, Sarah Marshall. And I, Sarah Marshall, am here. Okay. Um, Tammy Eli, Eli, would you please oh. call the Jones Library trustees to order? Okay. Um, Eugene Gofredo. You need to speak up. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Eugene Gofredo. Here. Um, Lee Edwards is at the table. That's right but she needs to confirm with her mic. Up here. Okay, and Nat Larson. I'm here. Okay. And um, I'm here too, Tammy. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. That's four of the six of you. And the Finance Committee, uh, Bob Hegner, please call the meeting to order and specifically check on any members that are um, beyond, besides council members. Yes, uh, I'm calling the, the Finance Committee to order at 6.07 p.m. And I see Bernie in the audience. Bernie, can you hear us? Yes, <clears throat> I'm present. Thank you. I think that's everybody. Okay. Uh, I'm here too, Bob. Tom Porter. Nice to see Great. you. Okay, thank you. Okay, there is no chat room for this. Um. It's, there is not a quorum of the regional school. Oh, yes, there is. There because, is a quorum. Yes. Yep. Sarah Bess, would you please call the regional school committee to order? Uh, call the regional school committee to order at 6.08 p.m. Uh, Anna Hurd? Here. Tillman? Present. Uh, William? Present. 
Sarah Marshall? Present. Jennifer? Present. Uh, Bridget? Present. Er? Present. Deb? Present. And Sarah Vest, the entire regional school committee is present. Thank you. Thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. To make a comment or ask a question, please click the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise as a result of using remote participation in Zoom particularly, Athena and I will decide how to address the situation. Uh, discussion may have to be suspended while we address those issues. And the minutes will note if we have any disconnection. Um, the discussion regarding, I'm sorry, during this part of the meeting, there is no public comment. I do want to call specific attention to the fact that there will be a public forum on the FY26 budget on Monday, November 18th at 6.30, okay? And at seven o'clock on that same night, which is a regular town council meeting, we will have a public forum on supplemental appropriations for FY25. With that, I'm going to turn to Paul Bachelman for the presentation of the financial indicators. We will then, after that, entertain questions from any members of the bodies that have been called. Uh, thank you, Lynn. So we have a presentation tonight that should take almost as long as it took to everybody to introduce themselves. <laughs> So um, thank you all for making the time to be with us. Uh, we've allowed a, about an hour for this entire process. Our presentation will be less than that, obviously. Um, this is a process that's unusual um, and unlike most communities, but it's, it's a tradition Mandy, in Amherst. Excuse me, Paul. Yep. Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. Sorry, um, when will we be able to download this presentation? I'm, I'm, post, I'm in the process of posting okay, it now. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. So this is a process that's unusual in most communities, but it's a tradition in Amherst. It's about communication early on in the budget process and ensuring that we all start off on the same foot. This is a the first, very first step in creating the FY26 budget. It's our staff's opportunity to share key financial information with you, the elected decision makers of the town. All materials shown tonight is po will be posted on the town's website at www.amherstma.gov. One of the things that we start, so tonight is the, one of the first days of, uh, day of standard time. We move the clocks back, so it's pitch black outside. Um, by the time we get to our budget presentation in the spring, it'll be bright and light and there'll be clarity. <laughs> um, this presentation is a team effort. And I really want to introduce our all women team who leads our finance department. We've had male finance directors in the past, but it's always been the women in our departments that have really done the, the bulk of the work. So our team is led by our newest member, finance director, Melissa Zawitsky. She's worked hand hard with everyone to make this presentation live up to the very high expectations the town has. We're really, really lucky to have someone who has both the knowledge of municipal finance and the understanding of how accounting, assessing, and treasure collectors officers, offices work. She's dug into all things financial, asking the right questions, and brings an approach to budgeting I think you will appreciate. Our team also includes Holly Bowser, our comptroller, and Jennifer LaFountain, our treasure collector, and Kim Yu, our principal assessor, although she, she was taking a back seat literally uh, tonight because she's going to make a presentation to you later about the uh, tax rate. Uh, um, I really want to thank Holly and Jen for taking such a leadership role during the time we didn't have a permanent finance director. This was above and beyond their normal day-to-day -day work, and the town didn't miss a beat throughout the process, so thank you both for being in that role. So we can do the slides. So just as the introduction, we go to the next slide. So tonight's agenda, um, we look back at FY25, uh, at FY24 a little bit, and we look at the 10 year history of where we've been and where we've gone. And this gives context to what you can see. So you can start to see trends. 
Um, we do a quick assessment of where we are in FY25, which is our current fiscal, fiscal year, and we look ahead to FY26 and beyond. Next slide. So these are the major takeaways up front that we, I wanna share with you. Major challenges, now more than ever, the town needs to maintain budget discipline as we take on major capital expenditures. Health insurances are big and they're very real. And every one of our bodies is uh, dealing with significant double digit increases in health insurance. We have new players in town hall and at the schools. We're all working hard to build those working relationships and make sure communication is current and accurate. And I do want to recognize that financial leaders for the school department are here as well. So thank you um, for being here. Um, you will hear this over and over. Um, we know we, we start with revenue. We look at, we project how much revenue the town is going to be receiving. And then we allocate uh, based on the guidelines created by the town council, those funds. And pretty much when you look back at the last decade, we are always, always bringing in about three to 4% uh, um, of revenue every year. So that's where we are. And you'll hear that st stated over and over. We're making progress on our major capital projects with more updates to come. And we recognize the pressure the economy is placing on our taxpayers and how much taxpayers are paying in their taxes. So we're very sensitive to that. So our goal is to maintain fiscal stability without, with, with strong financials. Without strong financials, nothing is possible. So important accomplishments. This is say. We presented the town's finances to S&P Global, which is the bond rating agency that we go to when we, um, before we go out to, to bid for bonds. And they look at all of our financials and they reaffirmed our credit rating as a double A plus. That's very good news. Through tonight's presentation, you will see that we have focused on maintaining a solid financial position for the town. This matters whether it's when it comes to maintaining current town services or when we enter the bond market to borrow funds. We are in FY25 with a balanced budget, and we have had excellent success in securing millions of dollars of grants to carry out major infrastructure projects, including the new elementary school, new library, and roadway improvements. And we have solid financial base. I've mentioned several times, outside bond rating agencies reaffirmed our strong fiscal management and the steps we have taken to prepare for the future. We have strong systems in place that protect our, our resources. Our staff work together, take a team approach to problem solving and address major issues as they arise. And we have managed to maintain slow, steady growth at a pace that we can afford. Next slide. So now we're gonna turn it over to Melissa, who's gonna go through our, these are the indicators that we'll look at over a 10 year period. Good evening, everyone. Um, so this is the beginning of our, Melissa, if you just want to speak clearly into your microphone so everyone can hear you. Thank you. Good evening. Can we hear me now? Okay, great. Um, so this is our financial, uh, trends, um, report and financial indicators. Um, there is a side note here that, um, we've been doing this report, um, since about 2007 when, um, it was, uh, compiled by, I believe, uh, John Musanti, so you're a friend of the town and, and myself. Um, I believe he worked on that as a graduate student, but, and it um, is part of best practices from ICMA and um, other financial GFOA practices, and we like to repeat it. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, I'm ready to go to the next slide if you are. So this is a look at our, our history of our revenues um, for the last uh, 10 years. And you can see that um, it's not clear from this slide, but I, I think it's important to note that the, the revenue has increased over the 10 years in that uh, three to 4% range consistent with what we have forecast for revenue growth over that period. And the budget um, remains within that three to 4%. You'll notice that the, um, distribution of the um, revenue sources um, is, is shifting from, um, from state and local receipts to the uh, property tax base. Um, and that's primarily um, 
driven by the fact that uh, local receipts, um, while all um, areas are growing, the tax base is growing higher and that, um, that we are becoming more and more dependent on um, taxes that we collect here in the town. Um, state receipts are rising um, steadily at about two and a half percent, but the uh, property tax are, raise, are rising at a rate of more uh, of four and a half percent. Um, and that has to do with the fact that we are limited by uh, two and a half. And then we um, have done some growth here in the town of Amherst and that helps us grow that, that tax base. And that is something that we don't have in other areas. Local receipts um, fluctuate from year to year. So a lot of times in a local receipt, the reason it remains level is that one area will increase greatly while other areas drop off. Um, and they're sort of inconsistent from year to year and they are the most um, vulnerable to the economy. Um, and we'll talk about that later, about why um, they're based on the economy and what keeps them sort of level is the fact that they are diversified in where the, the income comes from. That's all I have to say about that. Uh, and so again, uh, our our budget um, has grown uh, about thir three three and a half percent. So in the three to four percent range year over year in the past ten years. Um, and while the different sectors of the community have been um, being uh, given the same increase year over year, the sectors that are growing the the most are. Um, the, the sectors of unappropriated uses, miscellaneous, and capital. Um, and some highlights I wanna make about that is that um, that the unappropriated use, so what, what con that consists of is the um, primarily uh, assessments from the state or other uh, regional agencies like Piner um, Valley Planning Commission. And so the driver and that increase um, in the, um, in the unappropriated use is um, choice and charter out, um, a grow, grow at a, a very large clip, and so does um, regional transportation, so the PVTA bus. Um, and so that's what's driving that increase. And then in uh, miscellaneous, the drivers in that increase are, are uh, retiree benefits, so um, retiree health insurance essentially, and retirement assessment from our retirement board. And then finally, capital is growing, um, but I wanna sort of point out that that's a deliberate um, investment in infrastructure and that um, you know we're, we're maintaining um, our 10.5% uh, growth of, of the tax base for the um, outside, but there are other factors that um, contribute to our capital, which like the CPA fund, which is an outside source of funds, and the um, override debt exclusion that we'll see on the uh, school coming to us this year. Um, and I think it's also important to, to mention that in all three of those sectors which are growing, which makes it appear that the other sectors are shrinking, those um, sort of uh, those that sources, those uses of funds are distributed among all of the sectors of the government. So while they're growing, not in the town or the region or the library, they are, those, those three sectors are shared among the four um, groups here tonight. Okay, good evening. Um, this slide is showing property tax revenue, and this is the primary source of both operating and capital spending. Um, this includes new growth. Um, annual increases are limited by Proposition 2.5 and unless the town passes an operating override, and this was last done in fiscal year 2011. Um, the graph shows the blue line being actual dollars and the red line being constant dollars, and this is just showing that inflation is not quite keeping up. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, uncollected property taxes. So this slide shows a 10 year history of uncollected taxes as a percentage of the net levy. Um, we just wanna point out again that in FY20, this was slightly higher due, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
um, the town adopted an extended due date that pushed the fourth quarter um, due date from May 1st to June 30th without any penalty. And this also pushed the demand bills into July. So the collection went into another, the next fiscal year. Um, we did rebound and um, came back under the 2% mark and have slowly come down since then. And last year we're at about 1.44%. Um, so overall, this slide shows our collection rates to be very favorable to the bond rating agencies as we have remained well below the 5% or above warning indicator. Okay. Um, so we talked about um, state aid. State aid has um, increased um, pretty um, steadily um, over um, the 10 year history. Um, I believe around 2%. Um, and what, what we're seeing here though, is that even though the state aid is increasing um, in comparison to inflation on the constant dollar, we are um, losing ground um, in this revenue source, which is part of how it um, sways on our percentage of overall revenue um, in, the, in the pie that we saw earlier. Um, so compared to constant dollar, um, the state revenue is down approximately 4% from um, 2015. I think we lost a mic. Sorry. The 2023 dip that you see in um, as a percentage of revenue um, is sort of, it, it is still declining, but it that's accentuated by the fact that in fiscal 23, we made transfers into the general fund from stabilization um, about $5 million, which sway, uh, increases the revenue substantially enough that it uh, sways the other revenue sources. So still um, increasing as a receipt, decreasing as a percentage of overall revenue. Um, and we're, we continue to um, lose ground, unfortunately, in that space as compared to inflation. So um, this is a history of the uh, state aid. Um, and you can see that the um, state aid is growing, um, but so is unfortunately the state assessments. Um, and so you can see that we're slightly up um, as a net receipt, but I think it's important to say that the uh, assessments um, from the state are rising faster than the increases to state aid. So while we're um, getting increases to state aid at about two, two and a half percent, the increases um, to um, the assessment are um, almost 4% uh, a year annually, um, if you average it over the 10 year period. Um, and again, like I had said previously, the, the biggest drivers are um, Regional transportation, which up over the 10 year period is up um, $567,000. Um, school choice is up $263,000 approximately. And the um, charter school uh, tuition is up um, over 800,000, close to 900,000 at this time in this 10 year period. Am I doing that? Okay. Oh, yes, I am. Okay, never mind. Um, so economic growth. So the, 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 um, these primary sources of income in the um, economic growth driver um, are from building permits, motor vehicle excise, um, new growth as part of the tax levy, meals tax, and hotel motel tax. So 
Um, what you might notice is that we have a really good receipts in 2024. They did drop off um, in um, 21 um, and 20, probably due to the pandemic because, you know, construction, um, meals, um, hotel, motel was, was almost gone to nothing during some of that period. Um, I will say that um, one thing to make note of is that we um, have a very high growth in um, building permits for the year 2024. And what that is a reflection of, is we have um, three very large apartment complexes that were put into place around 2004. And you should probably see that in new growth, um, either part of what was in 2024 and probably part of what is coming in 2025. Um, so if I can just jump in there. So what that means is, so these economic revenues are things like, as, she, as Melissa said, the building permits. So we get two bangs for the buck. When you have a new project coming in, um, like one of the apartment complexes, they pay a significant building permit fee. And then when it, when it becomes occupiable, it, it's be added to our tax rolls. And so it hits, a, it hits our books twice. But what I did want to say about that is as nice as it is to get the building permit the that, unlike the new growth, is a one-time uh, fee, and the new growth is then permanently in the base. So those fees will not repeat next year. So that's something that we have to look at conservatively when we look at um, local receipts as a portion of the revenue, because we don't know, we have to know what projects are coming in order to anticipate that kind of um, fee income. Um, motor vehicles has been on a steady um, incline. Um, it, it, it dropped off slightly um, in 2021, but it, it is a steady uh, source of income for us and it creeps up slowly um, and we can count on that. And then of course, uh, hospitality, meals and hotel tax revenue has rebounded from the, um, the pandemic and we are um, back in business as they say. So that is good for the town and the economy. Okay, just one thing before we move on from the slide. I also want to um, just make a note of the 2023 dropping down to 4.2%. That was another um, another place where the additional transfers from the stabilization fund artificially increased our total budget. So if your total budget goes up, your percentage is gonna go down slightly. If we backed that out, that number would be closer to 4.8%, which would be right in line with where it was sort of pre-pandemic and for the last couple of years. So we are definitely rebounding. So next mm -hmm. slide. Okay, so this is the... Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> revenue per capita um, adjusted for inflation. So this chart compares our three major revenue um, sources. Um, the red line at the top is our property taxes and our biggest revenue source. And um, it does increase annually by the allowable limits of Proposition 2.5 and, and our new growth, which typically results in a 3% or higher um, increase over the prior year's um, tax, uh, tax collections. Um, this graph shows that property taxes have increased, but they're not keeping up with inflation per se. You notice um, as, as the um, property taxes go up, the space between the adjusted for inflation and the actual property taxes just gets bigger and bigger. Um, the middle is our state aid, um, the green lines, and that is our second biggest source of revenue. And the last revenue sh shown here, the purple lines, are our local receipts. And they have remained um, relatively flat. Um, and again, we're keeping better pa uh, pace with inflation. That, um, that gap isn't growing quite as much um, as stated earlier. And as everybody knows, they did drop during um, FY21 due to the pandemic, but they are back to normal now. Next slide. So this is our operating expenditures per capita, and again, adjusted for inflation. Um, when adjusted, you'll, you'll see that they don't seem to go up as much as the um, actual lines do. And uh, in, in reality, uh, when adjusted for inflation, um, our 2024 number is actually lower than our 2015 number. 
um, by um, a little bit about uh, just under 6%. Um, operating expenses per capita are, are very low in Amherst. This is both a positive sign of efficiencies and a challenge. Uh, the primary reason that the cost per capita is so low here in Amherst is because our population includes, as you all know, um, many uh, student residents um, on and off campus who do not pay property tax bills, but they do consume um, town services still. They use our roads and sidewalks, our parks and commons, um, they require public safety services as well, police, fire, ambulance, and they also utilize our public school system. Um, next slide. So by calculating the data per capita and comparing ourselves to other communities, it makes it easier to interpret much of the data in this um, presentation. And um, the colors here are shown, and, and I'm not sure if anybody explained this, but um, many years ago when we started this, um, they asked us to, um, they asked the town to compare ourselves to peer communities, communities that were very similar to us, but most of those communities were out in the eastern part of the state. So we also added some um, local communities um, several years back, and we've been doing these same communities for a number of years. Um, the colors on the chart are the bond ratings of each community. You'll notice at the top, you see a lot more of the purple and blues. Those are the triple um, Purple is the AAA communities, blue are the AA communities, and there is one um, just A community in the, uh, in the lower level. Um, this shows that Amherst is um, below all of our peer communities and the local communities, and we are at about 50% of the statewide average. Um, uh, averages according to DOR, yeah. So next slide. And, and just to note on that slide as well, um, we have to go back a fiscal year where most of the things we're reporting on FY24, but uh, the DOR website does not have all the current FY24 data. So we have to go back to FY23 in order to get it for every single one of those communities from the same place. So those um, comparison slides are a year behind the other slides. Um, so this is our municipal staffing levels. Um, this chart depicts the um, budgeted municipal staffing levels for the town of Amherst general fund um, only. It does not include our enterprise and it does not include any information on school staffing levels. Those can be found on their website. Um, this chart shows the past 10 years and shows that we've added approximately 17.5 FTEs or full-time equivalents. Um, so just to review the last couple of years, in FY22, uh, the number did not increase by, um, by barely anything. As a matter of fact, it went down slightly. Um, that year was a shift. We lost two police officers, but we um, budgeted for two Crest staff members to start um, the process of adding a Crest department. FY23 is the addition of the other eight Crest responders um, that came on board and started during FY23. And then in FY24, um, the tick up of four additional um, FTEs is taking on the four additional firefighters that had initially uh, been funded with ARPA revenues. Those are now in the operating budget for FY24. Okay, so then this is uh, salaries and benefits as a percentage of the total budget. And um, as expected, when salary and benefits rise, um, so will the, um, I'm sorry, when staffing levels rise, so will the, um, the benefits. Um, benefits include our COLAs, STEPS, retirement cost, and insurance, um, unemployment insurance, life and health insurance. Um, and I just wanted to point out the one thing that confused me a little bit on this slide was um, on the left hand side, the the dollars go with the red bars and um, how many millions of dollars are salary and benefits. And then the headings on the um, right hand side are the percentages which go with the blue and the green line. So what you will notice is that the blue line shows the salary and benefits as a percentage of our total operating budget. And although it has fluctuated a bit over the years, it remains relatively consistent at about 50 to 55% of our total budget over the last 10 years is people or our salaries and benefits. And the green line shows that um, 
the benefits as a percentage of just salary and wages. And that um, runs approximately 35 to 42 percent. And that's what most people think of as a fringe benefit percent. That is the percent of salaries that is um, it, it that is the um, the benefits. Uh, the change from a uh, self-insured um, to a fully insured group plan with Maya several years back has helped to kind of level out our health insurance costs. Um, if anybody remembers from several years ago and you looked at those health claim trust fund um, benefits, they were, they were um, much more volatile. Now we have a fairly uh, level, predictable line there. Next, anything else? Did you want to add anything else to that one? Okay. Okay, so this slide shows our debt service as a percentage of revenue. Um, closer. Ooh, okay. Um, this is our annual debt expense as a percent of our operating net revenue. These are our annual principal and interest payments on existing debt. Um, because our debt expense is low, uh, currently at 0.8%, we have greater flexibility to issue new debt, um, and it's declined in the past few years as we've paid some things off um, purpose on purpose um, to get ready for the new building projects that are on the horizon. Um, so in the next couple of years, this percentage will increase due to those debt authorizations that were approved through the capital improvement plan. Um, the elementary school is the first of the big projects to impact this and debt service is part of the capital budget. So next slide, please. Okay, so this slide shows us compared to other communities throughout Massachusetts and above compares us. So the top is um, to other communities and the bottom is our local community, our neighboring communities. Um, for debt service as a percentage of the operating budget. This will look different in the next few years as more debt is taken on with a few of the big projects underway. And our credit rating is strong due to a low percentage of debt relative to general fund revenue and also to good fiscal management. Next slide. Right. So um, Amherst long-term debt load has remained relatively low and has actually just decreased in recent years as shown in this slide. This percentage includes both long-term and short-term outstanding debt. Um, this chart does not show authorized but un unissued debt like the Jones Library and a portion of the elementary school. Once these items are borrowed for, our outstanding debt will reflect an increase in, in our percentage. This increase, um, the increase that is showing includes the first borrowing of just under $12 million as the first phase of the elementary school is underway. Next slide. Okay. This is a comparison to other communities in Massachusetts above and below a comparison to our neighboring communities showing what our outstanding debt is as a percentage of assessed value for FY23. These charts are long-term outstanding debt only. Currently, um, Amherst is still the lowest but again, this is gonna change in the next few years as more debt is taken on. And we just wanna say again that we maintain a strong AA plus credit rating as a result of this low percentage of debt relative to our general fund revenue. So um, this is our, um, um, uh, slide depicting our OPEB and our pension um, um, liabilities. Um, as everybody is is well aware, um, the Hampshire County Retirement Board and the town of Amherst are taking these liabilities seriously and trying to fund them over time. Um, Hampshire County Retirement is currently funded at just over 75%. I believe it's 75.01% of their outstanding liability, and they plan to be fully funded um, by 20, FY 2032. Um, our OPEB fund is currently funded at approximately 13%, just over 13%, and our plan is to re um, redirect additional monies 
um, that we will eventually be saving when Hampshire County retirement becomes fully funded and our annual contributions will decrease. We plan to redirect more of those funds to our OPEB liability so that we can um, get, a, get a, a good start on getting that completely funded as well. A uh, new OPEB study is done um, every two years. So those numbers do fluctuate over the years when a new actuarial study is done. Um, it may throw the funding um, down slightly as our liability grows a little bit, but we are making strides um, towards uh, becoming fully funded in the OPEB as well. Next slide. Okay, this is... Um reserves as a percentage of the general fund budget. And so um, obviously um, this number, well, first, you know, as, as many of you here are aware, we have um, financial policies in place that um, have us maintain a 5% um, free cash after it's certified, 5% of the um, operating budget um, in free cash. And then, um, we move an another 5% or 10% to this. To, we move, is it 10% to staples or five? Yeah, 10. Yeah, the general. Um, and that, um, you know, bringing it to like 15% reserves. We are currently above the goal of the 15% reserves intentionally. Um, and this is due to um, wanting to increase the capital stabilization in plans to offset some of the um, upcoming um, capital projects. We currently have on the horizon about four major capital projects that we need to fund kind of simultaneously. And the plan for that is to build up the capital stabilization so that we can normalize the um, debt payments over time and not exceed that um, 10 point 5% of capital directly from the budget. Um, you'll notice here also the dip uh, from 22 to 23, and that is um, a consequence of when we took $5 million out of the stabilization and put it into um, the cost of the current uh, school project that is underway. And so um, this is our reserves as compared to our peers. And you can see that we are fairly strong in compared to our peers. We were not the most um, funded of other communities, but we do rank high on the bar here. And I, I just wanna call out uh, Northampton um, because they are the highest of our peers locally. Um, and they had um, an intention to do that uh, for a different reason than Amherst does, but the idea is to hold reserves year over year and bleed it down in a, um, a planned um, manner to stabilize the impact of um, high cost um, capital projects over time so that we can um, do the repairs we need um, and not just keep deferring those maintenance on this building. So it's a it's by design. So I'm sure that you will see over time that Northampton will draw theirs down as well um, with the same kind of intention we will. Um, I will say that theirs was created by an override. We have no um, plan at this time to do an override and that's why we're saving so aggressively to help manage these projects. So that comes back to me and I will, I'm going to race through some of these because I know we've taken a long time to make the presentation. Um, we just, I want to reaffirm what the S&P global ratings, that's sort of the um, gold standard for cities and towns. What is your bond rating? It's really important. Many things we can't control. The wealth of our community is one of those things that we can control are listed here. And basically it's about um, good operating principles, strong financial management, those types of things is on the list on the left. Um, on the right, we have the um, our health reserves that Melissa just talked about. So we have our capitalization, capital stabilization fund, and we have our reparation stabilization fund, which we're continuing to contribute to. Next slide. 
So budget highlights um, for FY25, we've had good collaboration. You know, we had some strong discussions in the spring and wound up at a 4% increase for all the operating budgets. And we've, the, we've been able, um, all the entities have been able to continue the investment in capital and sustainability. Ongoing, we all face the sort of same things, inflation, um, we have to work out the regional assessment and relationship with the regional school district. Uh, everybody's experiencing the rising health of, of health insurance and retirement and OPEB liabilities are a high priority. Growing the tax base to support the demand for new services is always a priority as well. Next slide. So here's our working assumptions for FY26. So this is the revenue piece. So this is the upcoming fiscal year as we enter in. And this is where the council should begin thinking about what it wants to do. Our, we, we assume a property tax increase of two and a half percent, which is the most that's allowed under Prop two and a half. We're pro, uh, assuming a new growth number of $650,000, um, which is about average for what we have done in the past. We're looking at state aid to be flat, flat. Um, a little bit nervous about an economic downturn and that often impacts the um, state budget. Uh, we're looking at modest growth from year to year um, for local receipts and we're not pro uh, proposing an override. Next slide. In terms of our ex uh, expenditures or our budget, we're now comfortable projecting a 3% increase for the town, the elementary school, the region and the library for the town's appropriation. And this would be the for the, so that was that's up previously when we showed this to the finance committee previously we we're at two and a half percent we're pretty comfortable with the projections at this point in time and we always try to make that as accurate as possible um we do want to sit, note that there are some unknowns out there we have a lot of collective bargaining agreements that are not settled uh, all of our you know, on the on the school side there are three that are unsettled and two that are set two that are settled for the town it says that we have six unsettled we have um, all of our unions, except for the fire union, are under contract through June 30th of 2025, and we are hoping to get them all under contract prior to the beginning of July 1, 2025. And I'm very hopeful that we'll have the fire union settled in, in the very near future. And we all, the, the um, we agreed that um, one of the sort of hazards is um, on the health insurance, we're projecting a 13% increase. Now, when we talked to our health insurance company, they said somewhere between 10 and 15% off the top of their heads. This is not a good number, you know, like a solid number, but just seeing what they were looking at in terms of our experience, they wait until they get our November experience to before they actually give us a number, which we will get in January. So we put in, we uh, between the schools and the town, we agreed 13% would be the increase, um, but I just caution that it could be higher. And if it's lower, it will be elated. Um, so when we look at what our assumptions are for where we're allocating our funds, we do have to meet our, our, um, our contributions to, uh, the Hampshire County retirement system. We are estimating a 12% increase in that. And we want to maintain our contribution to OPEB, which is retiree health insurance. It's a modest amount, $50,000, but it's something that the, um, the, the ratings agencies really pay attention to if they, if you're disciplined enough to continue to start to meet that responsibility. Um, we would like, we, we really recommend that we maintain, uh, the capital investment at 10 and a half percent of the levy and continue to be conservative in our budget budgeting with careful management. So we talked with, um, uh, these are sort of redundant in some ways. And if it's not, I'll mention it. For the town, I've mentioned all the things that we are focused on. The schools identified ESSER funds as, as being uh, gone, the needs in their facilities, state aid, the transition planning for sixth grade move, the sixth grade move to middle school, significant increase in health insurance. Um, they're also noting that transportation is going out for bid. And so they're anticipating an increase for that, plus the uh, union negotiations. For the library, they identified their JEDI, which is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts, patron demand for services, increased costs that we're all experiencing, uh, and their greater growing dependence on the endowment and fundraising. And then of course, facilities and grounds and staff development. So the big picture going forward. Um, so most of the growth will come from our own resources. I think we cannot rely on the, uh, 
the uh, new that much new growth to expand our tax base. Um, the I'm not going to read all of these things. They're sort of it's sort of we talked about these things a lot. Um, we have our concerns on the left and how we're sort of managing them. If on the right, again, utilizing reserves, um, seeking additional sources of funds, sustainable development, uh, which is you know new new construction. Um, and then we are hoping or expecting that as we build new buildings or as we make investments in sustainable, our ongoing costs or expenses, say for electricity, will uh, drop. That will give us a little bit more elbow room in our operating budgets. Next slide. Ah. And who's going to walk through this? So um, this is our... Um, and and maybe, maybe, maybe we just sort of go... I think it might be worth it just to, we can talk about this with the finance committee because I'm looking at the time and we haven't had any chances for for questions, if that's okay. These are the last two slides, it's this spreadsheet, but I think we identified the major drivers in this already. Thank you very much. Um, this was always informative and uh, scary, to put it mildly. Uh, we are going to entertain questions from those boards that are here, and I see a hand up, and it's Gen uh, school committee person Jennifer Shaw. Hi, thank you for that presentation. So I have a I've, my questions are about the eye chart slides. Um, is that okay? So first, I wanted to request in the future when you show us these slides that you that you fill in the percent change column for all the rows. The percent change column is only filled in for the subtotal, subtotal rows, not for each individual item. And it's helpful to look at the percent change for each item so that you can see which items are growing faster or slower than the total. So you can see sort of what's driving the growth. You know what I mean? The percent change column. Well, in this, every single row in addition to the subtotal, like you're, the, those columns are just, those rows are just empty. There's nothing there. You can just copy paste the formulas down. Okay, anyway, so I'm trying to figure out why if our town revenue has gone up or is projected to go up by 4.6%, why the operating budget for the four departments is only going up by 3%. And in fact, the you're showing what the town council has informed the school committee that you would do, which was to base the percent increase on the amount allocation amount for the regional school committee not including the additional um the additional funding that was that was given so that's what you said you were going to do that's what's shown on the on the um on the spreadsheet and in fact it reflects a one percent increase over the total amount that was given last year so anyway when i look at the expenditures page um slide 33 you know the operating budgets are going up by 2.5 percent actually not three percent because of the because of what i just said and there are other areas that are going up by more than the 4.6%. So that means that they're getting more a share of the revenue. So it looks like most of it, um, or a big portion of it, is coming from the line item called cash capital tax support. That's going up from 4.1 million in fiscal 25 to 5.5 million in fiscal 26. And it's an increase of $1.4 million. And according to my calculations, it's an increase of 33%. So can you tell me what's in that line? It's on page 33, the line called cash capital tax support. Please speak to the microphone. That's the, um, that's the 10% of tax taxable. Um, it's not showing. So that's so that's how we come to the ten and a half percent of of property tax um, for capital investment that is built into the budget. So some of the other increases in that capital area come from other financing sources. So they're not part of um, recurring tax revenue um, as part of the operating budget, um, specifically. Like when you see um, debt service um, from CPA or PEG, that means that's debt service supported from funds outside general fund revenue. So we don't 
um, those are transfers in from another department. So that's why, and then also what's really important to look at here is that the um, debt service for the, um, the new um, elementary school, um, and that's a projected number because we haven't borrowed that money yet, but you know we have a bid, we may need to go out for it, we may not, but that's the projected um, dollars from the, um, from our financial advisor on what the, our first payment will be on the, the larger um, second borrowing for that. But that money, that um, debt excluded money um, can't, it is raised separately on the tax bill and cannot be used for operating costs. So, so okay. Um, so but the operate, the, the tax capital, that's our capital plan that buys fire trucks, buses, um, vans for the council on aging, a DPW trucks, roads and um, sidewalk repairs, park improvements. And that uh, number is the 10% um, of the um, tax taxable. Okay, so I wasn't asking about the debt service lines. That, that, okay. that those seem pretty straightforward. I was specifically asking about the cash capital parentheses tax support line, which was, Right, you know, it was so, five point so, three million in tw fiscal twenty four. It was four point one million in twenty five, and now it's up to five point five million and projected for fiscal twenty six, which debt, is a one point four million. That's increase. because debt goes down and cash goes up. So it's the total number there is what's important. Um, for the total, it, okay. We, because when we have less debt, we pay cash for more items. Okay, so Does that, that makes sense. Cash capital tax tax report is it ten percent or ten point five percent? Ten point five percent. Okay, I mean, that's a huge number. That's 1.4 million that that line item is increasing compared to e any of the operating budgets, which whose increase is a far lower percent increase and a far lower actual increase. I'm not, I'm just saying this out loud for others. I don't ex necessarily expect you to, to have an answer for that. Thank you. Um, the next person that has their hand up is Pam Rooney. Thank you. Um, a number of times it was mentioned that health insurance is increasing greatly. And at one point, uh, while we were still town meeting, I believe we were self-insured and it was something that, that Sandy Pooler uh, assured us was a really healthy and cost-effective way to manage uh, health insurance cost. At some point we transitioned to a different system. Have ha Are we continuing to look for ways to, to um, self self insure or manage the health insurance differently sure um so the uh we were self insured and it basically um went broke and that's when we moved and made the critical decision of moving into being fully insured the we have an insurance advisory committee which is in, includes representatives from all the bargaining units in the town it's as, as an employee insurance bargaining and, and health insurance advisory committee and uh, it includes staff from the town as well uh, and the schools. And what we're looking at is plan design changes to try to uh, moderate that increase. And there are certain tools that we can do to tweak. You know, we can raise deductibles uh, uh, and uh, co-pays and things like that. And that will reduce the, incre the increase to a certain amount. But okay. if the, I think a few years ago, um, you know, Holly and Jen remember this, you know, we had to make that hard decision about the, the uh, being self-insured just wasn't working anymore. Would you like to add further to that, Holly? Um, I was just going to say, given the environment, that I don't think that um, being self-insured would even remotely be a better option right now, being in a pool of other municipalities and a very large pool where we can spread those out um, over a larger number of employees is a much better place to be. Pam, is there any further follow-up on that? Okay. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Councillor Todd. Um, yes, I just wanted to ask under big budget strategies going forward, um, uh, pilots seem to be absent. Can I know that that's not something we can count on, but as for negotiation, if that could be included or, or why wasn't that included? Sure. When we put in, I, I put that under agreements. It's called agreements. I call it because um, the people don't, some people want to call it pilots. Some others don't like to be 
calling it pilots. It, pay, pilot for those is called payment in lieu of taxes. It can also just be fees or, or contributions that, um, so we do have a, uh, by the university and the colleges is really what we're talking about. So we have an agreement with the University of Massachusetts. We're really gonna drill down and get, try to get an agreement uh, with the college this calendar year. Um, and then we, then we take on Hampshire College. With Ham with Hammers College, when I say the college, so when that when those funds when we can, once that is inked, we'll be able to uh, process that, those funds as well. Okay, thank you. The only actual payment in lieu of taxes we get is the small amount we get for state-owned land. Yeah, that's technically pilots. Uh, Councilor Haneke. So I'm still trying to digest all of this. Um, it's the first time we've seen actuals for FY24 um, and, F and free cash certification and all of that. And I know we normally have conservative budgeting. Um, so I have a couple of questions um, on the choices for FY26 projections um, as they relate to FY24 actuals listed on this sheet on whatever page it's on, 33, 32, I don't know what it is, because um, I'm I'm doing it other places. Um, I think you said in the presentation that you're taking a little bit of a conservative approach to the local receipts because of potential slowdowns in economies. Um, but I guess one of my questions is, is it too conservative? Um, the actuals in FY24, and maybe you can explain why some of these seem really high, for licenses and permits were $1.7 million. Um, and your FY26 projection is $1.0 million, um, a nearly $700,000 decrease from the FY24 actuals, but also lower than FY22 and 23 by over $200,000. So I, I understand that maybe FY24 might be an anomaly, but 23 and 22 were $1.3 million and FY26's budget is only $1 million. Um, seems like maybe another 300,000 into the revenue side could help the expense side of the core services. Um, similarly, I think this investment income is probably the anomaly, $1.9 million. Um, is a, If you can explain why that one is so high, it's more than double what FY23's actual worth. Um, and how that works into the budget, you've budgeted a half million dollars, um, which is a lot lower um, than 1.9 million. Um, but, but where are those significant differences coming from? Uh, miscellaneous, you say see a note section, but I haven't seen a note section, so I don't actually know the difference there. Um, the last FY23 and 24 actuals were 560,000. The budget is 340,000. That's a difference of about 200,000 again. Um, so if we look at some of those and project closer to the actuals, we're looking at close to another million dollars or more in revenue that could then be put into the expense side. Um, the miscellaneous and the other financing sources is also quite low at $75,000 in the projection for FY26, where the actuals have always been over 100,000, if not close to 200 or more thousand. So these seem like extremely conservative projections on some of these um, that frankly directly resulted in an FY24 actual surplus of $5.7 million, which I know we'll get to later in tonight's meeting. Um, but 5.7 million, even 10% of that were a little, you know, I'm trying to, figure, you know, it's, I haven't dug into where that's coming from, but $500,000 split amongst three or four different groupings is another employee or two, um, even if we're looking at that. So I guess I'd like to know where some of those really, to me, seeming conservative projections are coming from. But also a, a bigger question is when we look at the FY24s, which is not an anomaly anymore when you look at 22, 23, and 24 all being near five or more million dollars in surpluses, 
Are we being too conservative? What is the percentage of our budget that we seek to have as a surplus every year? Are we too high? How do we get closer so that we can actually use that money within the operating budgets and capital budgets of the year, not when we come here in November and reallocate them out um, when we get to the next part, my question will be, should we be looking at some of that surplus to plan to use in an FY26 operating instead of moving it over to capital stabilization or some of these other projects? Um, so that's sort of my first set of kind of big picture, kind of digging down. So so um, those are really important questions. I think we really expect, okay, sure. Sorry, one other one that I just saw. Um, the assessment, retirement assessment, that 12% $1 million increase uh, uh, is what was zero last year that allowed us to go up to 4% in all of the functional areas, right? Yes. And 12% is basically double what we normally see. So we kind of, is, is that is that true? 6.5 to 6.9 to 7.5. It's about double what we normally see. So we actually got a one-year reprieve, but are paying for it in FY26. Is that the case, sort of? Yes, there's, yes. We get a temporal win right. for that one. Um, and for uh, the other questions, those are really important questions to talk about at the Finance Committee in terms of how aggressive do you want to be on budgeting? You know, when we look at it, we come back with a 5%, you know, $5 million is 5% of a $100 million budget. That doesn't seem unreasonable to me. It, that seems to be where, where I would want to be in terms of conservative budgeting. The council can say, you know, in terms of your financial guidelines, you might want to say we want lower than that in terms of where you project our kind of reserves to wind up at the end of the year. We're also uh, on the posture in, in terms of the guidelines to try to build our reserves so we can take on it. We, we know every one of our entities has said we have facility needs and capital needs. So maintaining that 10 and a half percent is important. But you know, I think that that's you know, at this point in time in the year, we're usually pretty conservative on almost all of those numbers. And as we get more information, we tighten them up and we can be more um, aggressive on, on the budgeting. Uh, so we, we will learn that with our um, expenditures and with our income as well. In terms of like building permit fees and things like that, we know what projects are going through permitting now, you know, and that's, you know, at the end of permitting is when we get the building permit fees, there are very many, there are fewer and fewer in the pipeline, quite honestly. And so when we talk to the building department, they'll say, yeah, there's one or two out there, but they're not like three or four, like there used to be. So we do look at that and we talk to the assessors in terms of what they're hearing. So we try to base it on real information um, and, um, and past practice. And I think we try to avoid, you know, a, a 5% sh shift can be, you know, if, if we don't have 5% in there, I mean, we don't, we've just went through a pandemic where things really collapsed. And so I'm hypersensitive to recognizing, and, and we survived it because we had good reserves and, um, and preserved the services and, the, and um, the jobs for the people who work for the town. So I think that that type of thing, those are the values that we, we have brought to, this, to these projections in the past. Um, but I think it's a really important policy discussion to talk about how aggressive do you want to be on, your, on our budgeting. Okay. Um, Sarah Marshalls from the Amherst School Committee Chair. I only just raised my hand. Sure. <laughs> and I'll, I'll go ahead. I fully endorse um, Councillor Haneke's um, comment about how much uh, the size of the surplus, which seems to be about $5 million every year. And um, it's it's upsetting to see that because that's money that is not at work in our town or in our schools. And I understand not wanting to end in the red. I very much understand that. Um, but it really bothers me that that money, I guess, is swept into free cash and is, again, out of reach for the schools. Um, so I, I hope the finance committee and the council do consider uh, changing policy, maybe around either around the degree of conservatism in the budget or what to do with that surplus, like <laughs> maybe share it out among the <clears throat> town departments or some fraction of it. Um, I would also like to better understand the free cash and stabilization. Again, that's a lot of money, $28.6 million. 
not at work. Thank you. Is there any comment back at this point? No, okay. those are good comments. Um, uh, school committee member Irv Rhodes. I, I'm, I find myself being astounded that I am agreeing with uh, Mandy. I think over the years, we haven't agreed on very much. But I, I really agree with everything she has said, and I applaud you bringing those points forward, Mandy. The other thing that stood out to me is that pie chart, uh, where we looked at the elementary and region, regional share of the town budget uh, receding by 3% and 2% respectively. That was uh, something that I didn't expect to see, uh, given uh, what has been happening over the years. So I really would like to really understand that that recession, we went, you know, the elementary down by 3% and the region down by 2% in terms of percentage of over of the overall budget. Uh, and and, and, and given that, it seems that we really uh, should be concentrating on why is that that we're down, but yet um, there is concern about us spending more. Uh, so anyway, it, um, I, I, I guess I really want to dig into these numbers uh, some more because there is a lot of lot in there that needs to be explained in fuller detail. Thank you. Um, school committee member, Deb Leonard. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I've been looking forward very much to seeing what the actuals were. Um, uh, continuing along the, the question about um, uh, surplus, because uh, I've spent a fair amount of time with the town's budget and I've gone back to 2019, um, there has been no year where you predicted a uh, a surplus of any amount back to 2019. It's been negative in 2019 and then zero from there on. But over the last, um, over those six years, the total uh, surpluses not only have amounted to a, a fairly robust uh, stabilization account, but they've increased. Um, so I, I also question the uh, overall value in uh, telling the regional schools that there's just absolutely no money in the budget for a $355,000 increase. But um, here you, you, you uh, consider uh, a reasonable overage at the end of the, and, end of the year to be 15 times that amount. Um, so the region can't benefit from free cash at the end of the year. Any extra money that we have, we can't build into a stabilization account. There's no, there's no provision for that. If the town were to do that for us, that would be a way of sharing some of that uh, hmm. extra cash at the end of the year. But really, when we have such a large employee heavy uh, as, as do all these uh, sectors, we really need that operating cash to keep, keep the kids uh, educated, healthy, and happy. There's a lot that goes into it. And while I appreciate this issue of the uh, bond rating, <clears throat> nobody ever wrote a uh, letter to their former uh, whatever town councilor saying thank you for the bond rating. We will benefit very much from those capital buildings, but um, it can't come at the expense of the uh, the kids in, in the district. And when I say that, I mean, not just the elementary schools because children don't cease to become, um, cease being Amherst residents when they graduate sixth grade. I understand the region is a separate municipality, but it is very much one where um, many of our residents value the work that's done inside those buildings as well as the fact that those buildings are falling apart and we do not have as a region the ability to save that money on our own. So um, I would encourage you to really think long and hard as counselors about um, <clears throat> the statements that are made in the budget about how Amherst values uh, schools and yet again and again and again we're asked to cut our budgets and seeing these kinds of 
overages just are really, really difficult. So I would be interested in finding out how free cash, what looks to be about $10 million a year, comes about from um, these kinds of surpluses. Because I, I really have a hard time interpreting the budget. It looks like there's many different places where um, capital can be saved. Um, there's, there's the, and I, I don't understand all of them, but there's many different parts of lines in the budget where it says capital, 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 capital. And um, so, uh, thank you. Like, thank uh, you, Deb. Let, let me try to, mm -hmm. I want to address a couple of things. So first off, the, the region does have its own free cash. So, um, uh, so at the end of the year, you have, I forget what they call it, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's so, five um, percent. But we're also very hypersensitive to the challenges of the region. I mean, the having the ARPA money there as one-time money does create a, a larger um, challenge for next year, and we're we're working through what that might look like. I've been having conversations with the superintendent about what is what how we can help offset some of that. In addition, we have looked at um, you know you know, the health insurance, which, which, which is beyond our sort of real control, the big number is, and for all, everybody. And so in terms of getting above 3%, we're really focused on how can, because how can we make offset that big increase? So we are looking at this and we'll continue to work with it through the course of the budget making season. I need to pause for just a minute and uh, make sure that people know that the hearing that is scheduled for 715 will follow this as we convene the regular meeting of the town council. But we wanted to make sure not to cut the question and answer period short this year uh, on these budgets. Uh, with that, I'll move to Bridget Hines from the school committee. Um, hi, thanks so much for this presentation. Folks, this is really thorough and so well presented. It's very clear and and easy to follow. So I just appreciate your work first off. Secondly, I appreciated especially the chart on page three, comparing the trends across time, because a lot of times we're thinking, why are the schools losing ground um, so much? And then we see like the schools are down 5% of the town's overall funding, then you combine that with the other thing mentioned of this constant dollar loss from the state and the schools, you know, just were not able to provide the quality of instruction we once did. And then we're facing these dramatic cuts this year. So I think I just echo, you know, in a different way, the same thing that a lot of other people have said, because we see capital miscellaneous and free cash are up to full 7% of that chart. And it seems to me that some shift in spending priorities could help us to bridge this gap. I wanted to mention something to the, to the 3%. Our schools are funded by the state off the growth percentage, and we see these as 4 or 5% over year, year after year. And yet Amherst is still only discussing 3% So the schools, despite the fact that we're actually, the state expects us to be putting the growth percentile towards it. And then one final thing I know is just the schools are cutting numerous staff every year. We lost seven in the district last year. We're losing at the elementary. And then we just see the towns adding staff over year after year. So it feels like different fiscal universes. And I'm just wondering if the town has a strategy overall to mitigate these proportional decreases to the schools compared to other aspects of the town. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to comment on any of that? No. Okay. Uh, Anna Hurd. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit to Jennifer Shaw's comment about um, the way that you've um, presented the, the regional school budget and um, we had a four town meeting and I thought that there was some agreement about steps moving forward. And this is not in any way represented in this draft budget. Yeah. And together with, together with um, the historical surpluses 
and some of the other comments that have been brought up, this doesn't seem reasonable. It doesn't seem, um, I, I don't feel heard. In so from the four towns meeting, it seemed like everybody was in agreement. We had a, a plan moving forward and none of that conversation is reflected in this budget. Yeah. And for me, that's frustrating. Um, especially in light of all of the other evidence that suggests that it's likely affordable. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I would like to understand why none of the discussion that was put forward during the four town meeting seems to be represented in this budget. Do you want to address so, that, Paul? So we, we based this, um, this initial, this is what we're doing is sharing the information. This is not a budget. This is initial information with what we're projecting out based on our historical, uh, our history over the last decade. And that's what we present. This information goes to the town council and to the finance committee. And over the course of the next four or five weeks, they will work on budget guidelines. And that will be the controlling document for how we build our budgets for all the entities. So this is in base information. It's a recommendation, but ultimately the, the guidelines will be developed by the town council. It's a recommendation based on none of the discussion that we had during the four town meeting. Um, oh. so, yeah, so I, I mean, this is a staff's recommendation. I mean, this is our professional information and we're again, not based makers. on nothing that we discussed in the four town meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to, uh, counselor Kathy Shane, uh, who has not spoken yet. Kathy. Um, I'll get another chance this Friday and later today on some of the numbers um, that were presented. So I just want uh, to echo what Mandy has asked about some of the places that we may be under or, or overestimating. And secondly, to try to understand when you do miscellaneous, it has pensions in it. So some of the labor costs of the schools and other parts are in that line. So we're not always the pension line, as she as she said, is jumping up. Is health insurance health insurance? I'm assuming is in the elementary. And it's embedded as opposed to OPEB and it's in the pension. operating. Okay, so we've got part of the cost, and then the the Chapter 70 money you presented. I think. One chart is showing the total before the offsets for charter, and then later we're seeing the offsets for charter. Is that correct? Right. As, as I'm looking at that. So if I would just have a request for a finance committee that I could see total and then total once we send the money to the charter school, where would it be? Because I'm trying to understand what has really happened to state aid, because I think we're exaggerating state aid. It's even down more than one of the lines are because there's a negative coming off of it. Right. So of the Jerry seat. And I just want to understand the numbers. No, on the last slide um, graphs, there was a state aid and it had state aid with assessments next to it and the net line in the middle. So that's the net line is the lower number of the state aid. There's a little diagonal, there's a little the triangle. Triangles, yeah. 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 So that's the net number. Um, less the assessments, which includes, <laughs> you know, it includes UGA and Chapter 70 as the two big things, and it includes as the big assessments, um, charter and choice tuitions, as well as um, regional transportation. Those are the big drivers. Yeah, so I know this, you followed, you're using these um, indicators are coming off of what we've seen before, but I just I've never seen the detail under them. So if we could get just some of the detail the under it. Yeah, I'll so if I wanted to talk to the general public, what was state aid 20 years ago as a share of the school budget, what it is it now, and be able to show this draw that has happened since the charter schools opened up. Yeah, like I have that information. I'll bring it to you Friday. I don't have 20 years worth. Um, I have 20 years of overall revenues, um, but I'll get the uh, state aid 20 year history for you. 
Thank you. For Friday. I th let me just add to that. I think the real issue is that there are some costs that can that are attributed to the schools and also to the libraries that are embedded in other parts of the charts. Correct. Oh. That's what I was asking. So in the pie charts, yes, all three That's of the miscellaneous yeah. unappropriated yeah. uses. Nah. Nah. Excuse me. Oh, oh, oh do uh, all three of the growth areas, which are unappropriated uses, miscellaneous, and um, capital have shared costs between all four of the sectors of government. Okay. So that so, those parts that are growing much faster than any of the operating budgets of any of the sectors um, are also shared um, by those sectors. Right, and so I think the request is to have the breakout within those sectors so that we understand of those areas, what is school, what's library, what's town, okay? Is that, Kathy, does that get it? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go back to, um, uh, let's see, Councillor Haneke. I, I just wanted to correct this regional school committee member, Anna Hurd. Um, I did not leave four towns with Amherst in agreement with a plan going forward. So I think that from my point of view was a, not an accurate statement. Um, in fact, Amherst at that four towns meeting indicated that the scenarios one and two that Shootsbury and Leverett seemed to like the most would be extremely difficult for us to meet. Um, we did not agree to meet with them at that meeting. We said it would be nearly impossible to meet with them given the information we had at that time. That doesn't mean we're not going to continue to look as the questions and the comments at this meeting are indicating, let's see, but we did not make any agreements at that four towns meeting. So I. I take issue with a statement that said there were agreements at that meeting because there were not in my, from w what I left that meeting with. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Andy Steinberg, who has not spoken yet. Yeah, I actually was uh, thinking about the same question, same point that uh, Councillor Haneke was making. There was also a previous um, four towns meeting where we did have an agreement on a 4% and we made the point that uh, we could go to the 4% on a one year basis because of one time revenue that was never going to recur again. It was a matter of um, a fluke in the way that pensions were calculated for a single year so that we had, we had come to 4%, and then uh, beside, in, in spite of that, we're pressed for a higher increase, which was what happened at the uh, second four, at that next four towns meeting in, in April, very late in the budget process on the eve of town meetings in three towns. And as we were um, in Amherst, which is the largest contributor, uh, closing in on our budget. So it, it was a difficult process last year. I'm not blaming the schools, um, and the school committees in any way for making the request that they thought that they had to make. But, you know, there was a very unusual sequence last year. And I think that we all need to just find a way to work together, but work together in recognizing the last year was an extraordinarily difficult year and uh, one that um, had a lot of bumps along the path as uh, new school committee members became familiar with the process and uh, in this, as we were going through a period still with an interim superintendent. So, uh, you know, I think we need to just all work together ne uh, for next year and do what's right for next year, but to recognize the problems that were last year. Uh, from the school committee, Deb Leonard. Hi. Um, well, thoughts. Please make sure you speak to the mic. Thank um, you. 
one of them being I very much appreciate the, the opportunity to have this conversation in person. And um, thank you. Another, uh, Paul spoke to the the information being preliminary and, and it, it, there being a process, and that's great. When 10% um, of our budget is going to be um, perhaps appropriated in, um, in just two weeks from now with right after uh, the public forum on it, I, I, I question the optics, if not the, the process itself of certifying free cash so, so quickly. It, I'm not certifying, of, of appropriating it. It was certified on the 22nd of October. The, um, the memo was written November 9th and 11th. The memo, um, okay, that's wrong. The memo was written shortly thereafter. Right. Um, at the end of October, uh, it was attached. No, it's October 1st. It was, I'm getting the dates all muddled. But here we are. It's really not very far out. It looks like the process of deciding what to do with free cash is very, very much along the way with the, um, the requests being made. Nope public input so far, it's on an agenda. I have not been able to find any kind of noticing on the town website about that. I understand it is on the on the town's agenda, but the actual um, recommendations of the individual appropriations are in the packet in today's meeting. So there's a whole level of distress that I believe uh, the, the school committee is experiencing on combining, finding out that there actually is surplus and we are not um, down to the wire with money. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Um, I'd like to encourage you to, to think about uh, chapter 70 funding and chapter 90 funding in, in the same way. Understand that state is underfunding chapter 90 and you have in the past made a commitment to appropriating a million dollars a year uh, towards roads and sidewalks sort of to mitigate that, um, perhaps you could consider the same thing. Um, I understand that state money is state money, but in the end, roads and sidewalks are local as are school children. Thank you. I see no other hands. Are there any other I, questions or comments? Uh, may I make a point of information, please? Yes. Um, so the financial orders on the agenda this evening are for a referral to finance committee. Before the council can take action on those orders, we need a recommendation from the finance committee, and there will be a public forum on each of those orders before the council is able to act on them. So that will be posted once those dates are set. Question? Yes, is, please. Is that supposed to be noticed 10 days ahead? It, it hasn't been noticed yet because we haven't scheduled it yet. So, so the, the public forum is the required before forum. the council acts on it, the orders. There's no action on the orders tonight aside from a referral to finance committee. So finance committee needs to review the orders. They'll make a recommendation back to the council. Then we'll schedule the public forums and then the council will act. And at this point, the forum is tentatively scheduled and posted on the agenda for tonight. The public not forum. Not tonight. No, the public it's forum on the agenda that you see tonight, but the forum itself is on the 18th at 6.30. Right, and I I don't think that forum has been noticed. No, we're not within the 10-day period yet. So okay. we... Uh, okay, maybe I'm miscounting days then. So the, a public forum will be posted before the council is able to act on those orders. Um, and the finance committee will need to complete its review and recommendation before the council is able to act on those orders. There will be a public forum and a period of public comment on those financial orders before council action. Excuse me, Lynn. 
That's okay. Are there any other questions or yeah. comments? I have a question. I'm sorry, my phone keeps dropping to Zoom, so you don't see me on there. Even though it's I'm interesting. Not... I don't. I I wondered. I thought I saw your hand, and then yeah, I, it dropped me. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Paul might have answered my question when he said this is not a budget because I'm noting that the fiscal 26 projected column ends in a negative number, <laughs> which that it, it seems concerning, but no one brought it up. So <laughs> it maybe not, but so like, this is not the final no. and, and we're, we, we, we're not, we're not going to, we can't have a negative budget. We can't have a budget in the red. Is that right? Absolutely not. This is very preliminary numbers. This is basically the second draft. There'll be 10, 12 more before it's a balanced budget. Thank you. Let me, um, as, in and a I, way of better understanding that, let me step back and say, this is the opening discussion, okay? We don't close this discussion until June 30th of 2025. And in between then, we get budgets from the library, we get budgets from the school, we get lots of different updates, we provide guidelines, and on a regular basis, we see an update on the budget. Historically, what we have seen is increases. So last year, for example, I can't remember whether we started out at 2.5 or what, but we ended up at four. This year, we're starting at three, at least starting there. But there's a lot of time between now and June 30th. And so again, this is the starting discussion. And so as much as I hear people concerned about transparency. I don't know of any other town that is quite as open about their finances at this point. Deb? Anna? So I, I guess I would have, a, I, I would like a little bit more understanding of where the surpluses are coming from um, and so is it that we're underestimating certain portions of revenue and then which res which portions of revenue are we underestimating? Because I think that it, if the hesitation or the need to come to, a, you know, uh, an even budget is hindered by our inability to, to correctly project uh, revenue, then that's not helpful either. So if we're if we're suggesting that our our budget is must be limited because these are this is all that we can spend, but then at the end of the year we end up with a five million dollars surplus, we're doing something wrong, and um, it's not helpful. And yes, it makes us feel good at the end of the year to say, oh look, we have a surplus, we didn't overspend, but. What, what's happening is we're cutting services because we don't think that we're going to have enough money. And then we're hurting the people who, who need those services. And so I think that if we could do a slightly more accurate projection um, or maybe make that projection a little bit less conservative in order to more adequately fund the services that our citizens need, um, I think that would be bene more beneficial than ending up with a five million dollar surplus surplus every year. Thank you, Councillor Haneke. I was going to offer an answer, but on my brief one, but I think the town staff might be better able to. I but <laughs> if they're not I, prepared. I, you know, I was tempted to do the same, but there's going to be a lot of that discussion in the next phase of our meeting as well. But it, does anybody, Paul, or any of the staff, want to address? What creates surplus? Paul, you want to do it? So it is definitely a combination of things. Um, in fiscal year 24, um, we brought in um, approximately 4 million additional dollars of revenue. Um, one of the biggest chunks of that being um, some great investment by our treasurer and $1.9 million of interest income, which is completely unheard of. Um, and that is simply due to the fact that we have so many capital projects that have been backburnered a little bit. So that money is sitting there available to us to be invested until it is spent. Um, and then it was, I believe, and I'm just 
I'll have better numbers on Friday for the Finance Committee, but I believe about a $1.4 million um, of our expenditures that we did not spend um, due to vacancies, um, you know, cost of things coming in lower, um, et cetera. So it is a combination of both, um, more on the revenue side this year than on the savings of um, expenses this year. And, and I'd just like to add, in terms of the, um, the idea on, pro on projections is not just accuracy. I mean, I could, if we can look back in time, we can be 100% accurate. You can't be 100% accurate looking forward. And I think it's a valuable discussion to say, are we being too conservative or too liberal in how we project out expenses and income? Um, there is no, we cannot go negative. We cannot ha have it be below um, our budget um, because that puts us in deficit that equals negative free cash, which means you have to make that up in your next year's budget. So I think we're, you know, the, the mission of the professional staff is to make sure that that never happens in the town of Amherst. And we've been successful in that. Um, and we have to take into account uh, if someone can tell me what the um, bond market is going to be doing, what the stock, you know, what, what interest rates are going to be looking like next year, what construction rates are going to be in the coming year, what all these different things are going to happen. If there's uh, what gas and oil prices are going to look like, I would really welcome the, the inside information because we have to account for that and discount for that in terms of when we're making projections. So we are conservative, especially at this time of year. When we get closer to the fiscal year, we will have more clarity in January when we hear what the governor's budget is. That's when we get our real finance, our real health insurance numbers as well. And then when the Ways and Means budget comes out, that gives us more information. So I think there's lots of var variables. Um, neither, none of us have um, uh, collective bargaining insurance or collective bargaining agreements yet, and we don't know what those numbers look like either. So we have to carry a, a budget for those things. Uh, the schools do the same thing that we do for to do that to make to make sure that we have money in our budget to to pay our uh, employees. So there's just a lot of pieces to this. And, you know, I think it's it's a it's a healthy discussion to have. And I think everybody is raising really good, strong questions. Why are we do what we do? Are, are we doing it accurately enough to make sure that we stay um, in the in the in the black on our in our budget? So um, we welcome the conversation to, to continue. I see a hand from Sarah Best Kenny, chair of the regional school committee. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I, I have a quick question. So when uh, earlier in the presentation, you said a guess about 3% um, for each of the you know, main buckets. Uh, for the regional school, are you, where are you basing your 3% off of? The total funding from last year, the 3%, the 6%? I think the question, Paul, is 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 this three percent with on top of the six percent from last year? So when you, when you see the spreadsheet, the the ARPA money from last year is is as a separate line identified, but it's not included into your base, which is what the understanding was last year. So no. So the answer so no. is no. Yes, correct. The answer based off the four percent. It's four percent. It's three percent on top of the four percent from last year. Right. So if four. Assuming a four percent last year, it's based on that, and then three percent for this year. Yep, that is the way it is presently presented. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Yeah, I I know that there's been a lot of discussion, and will continue to be a lot of discussion as there should about how to budget and what uh, you do for budgeting and the consequences of. Um, under budgeting expended uh, for projections and having surpluses but I you know I've been involved in budget since I was on the first the, the former finance committee since 2007 and uh, as uh, difficult as it is the two most difficult years that I experienced in all of that time were the years where we had severe under budgets for um, in 2007 because of the recession that happened that flowed into 2008 in a severe way where we were actually cutting 
budgets that we had previously voted during the year because the state was um, cutting its state aid to us so that we had less revenue than we had budgeted for uh, because of this, um, how the state handled state aid at the time. And then um, in 2020, when we had to make accommodations because of the pandemic. And uh, as painful as this is, um, I just want to uh, share my observation that that level of pain is nothing like those years when you go the other way. And I hope, you know, I think that we're right to try and avoid that. And uh, I think that's a discussion that Finance Committee needs to have as to how close you want to go and what is the right way to approach it. But you don't want to get there, um, I assure you. Um, I'm going to move to adjourn the special meeting. I'm going to first call in the Sarah Marshall from the school committee to adjourn the school Amherst, Amherst school committee. We need to vote to do that, I assume. It's uh, we do, but you can do whatever your practice is. All right. I move to adjourn the Amherst school committee. Is there a second? Second, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, it has to be a roll call vote. Yes. Bridget. Bridget, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Irv? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. And I'm yes. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Jones Library Trustees, uh, uh, Tammy? Yeah, I think we've lost many of them, so I will just adjourn uh, okay. the meeting of the trustees. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Finance Committee, Bob Hegner? Yes, I uh, move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, we have to do a roll call vote. Uh, yes. I'll start with the counselors. Kathy? Yes. Andy? Yes. Uh, oh, Mandy, Joe. <laughs> I... Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think. Alicia. Alicia. Is here. Alicia and Bernie. Alicia? Yes. I? Okay. Okay, and um, I'm an I. Um, Tom? Yes. Yes, there he is. Bernie? Yes, good night. All right, we're adjourned. Okay. Regional School Committee, Sarah Best Kenny? Uh, I move we adjourn the Regional School Committee. Can I have a second? Again, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, Anna? Yes. Irv? Yes. Sarah Marshall? Yes. William is a William? yes. <laughs> uh, Deb? Yes. I am a yes. Jennifer's a yes. Uh, Jennifer, thank you. Tillman? Still here? No. Uh, Tillman had to step away at seven. Okay. Uh, I'm missing one. Anna? No. We oh, got Anna. Did you get Bridget? Bridget. Okay. There's enough of us. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I move. I'm going to move to adjourn the special meeting of the town of the uh, budget coordinating committee, particularly the council, and seek a second. Second. And Rooney. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Aunt Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councillor Eddie. Aye. Lynn Greasemers. Aye. Councillor Hannigan. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break while we kind of reassemble for the next meeting. Please make sure you turn your mic off and your video and turn it back on when you return.
I just want to remind you, we're going to reassemble in about three. Uh, I would like to reconvene the meeting as fast as possible. We have an, a full agenda. We need to reconvene the meeting. Thank you.
Okay, I'm going to get started, gang. Um, it is still November 4th. Um, and this is now the regular town council meeting. Um, we are, I'm not going to go through all of the things about open meeting law. I'm just going to basically say that given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the meeting to order at 8 o'clock p.m., I do need to make sure that you are all here and can hear and be heard. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmer's present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Councillor Walker. Present. Thank you. All right. Um, we are going to immediately, I just want to call attention to the fact that your um, agenda is filled with upcoming meetings. I'm not going to go over them, except to mention yet again, on the 18th, we are meeting as a council. We begin our reading period of the town manager's evaluation at five. It's Boring for the rest of the public because we're not saying anything. You're not even seeing our pictures. At 6.30, there'll be a public forum on the FY26 budget. And at 7, a public forum on the supplemental appropriations for FY25. On December 2nd, we also have a regular town council meeting with the state of the town. And on December 16th, we have our last council meeting ostensibly for the rest of the year. Um, so, and then there's a bunch of, uh, count of, um, committee meetings. I've tried to post them and consult with each committee chair in pulling them onto the agenda. Uh, we are going to move immediately to the hearing on tax classification. This hearing was set for 715. It will include a presentation, an opportunity for public comment, and then we will have a motion to close the hearing and proceed. Welcome, Kim, who is our chief assessor. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. Um, I see some new faces, so I'll go fairly quickly because I know we have a lot to do tonight. But if something doesn't settle or you have a question, um, stop me, please, because I want to make sure everybody understands what I'm going to say. Um, so tonight we are doing the classification hearing for the fiscal year 2025. Next slide, please. Oh, I also just want to make quick note that we do have a vacancy on our board. So if you know anyone who's interested in being a member of the Board of Assessors, please have them come our way. Um, okay, so tonight, the things that we are going to be voting on are a single or a split tax rate and then the exemption. So the open space discount we'll just briefly touch on right now. We don't use this exemption. We use chapter land classification instead rather than just open land. Um, we'll use that for the farms. Uh, the small commercial exemption we'll be going over as well as the um, residential exemption. Next slide, please. So we've been doing the tax classification hearings since 1978 um, when the Tax Classification Act was passed. Um, and we basically this, this act is to um, have us classify our properties based upon these four um, categories as well as open space. Um, so we have residential, we have commercial, industrial, and personal property. Next slide, please. And so um, as most of you know, the residential class is, is the class that's used for human habilitation. So someone's home. Um, so that includes accessory buildings, that includes um, swimming pools, tennis courts, garages, sheds, basically anything that can be included in a home. Um, this also includes apartment buildings all the way down to the single family home. Um, the commercial class includes property that is held for a purpose of conducting a business. Um, and this also includes our farmlands. 
the industrial property um, is property that is involved in manufacturing uh, and the processing or extraction. Um, we have a very small industrial uh, class here in Amherst. And then lastly is our personal property class. Um, and this is basically um, for the commercial and industrial properties. Um, and it's pretty much in a very quick explanation. If you picked up a building and dropped the floor off and shook it, anything that fell out would be considered personal property. So desks, computers, chairs, phones, uh, pictures, you know, anything like that. Uh, next slide, please. Love the image. <laughs> Um, so this is just a breakdown for you as to what our classes look like. So we are 88.5% residential. Um, we have a 6.1% commercial, a 5.2% personal property, and then a little bit less than 1% of the industrial class. So overall, this is a 12.3% commercial and industrial and personal property class which is an important figure that you'll want to remember for later, and I'll bring that up again. Um, and then again, versus the 88% of residential. Next slide, please. So this basically just explains one of the things that we're going to be voting on tonight, which is the split or single tax rate. So the single tax rate, also known as a factor of one, is a single rate throughout every class. Every class pays based upon the same tax rate. Um, you have two options. You can shift the um, factor of less than one, and that is going to shift the burden among the classes, um, reducing the residential rate. Um, this is most common. So the commercial industrial personal property will pay a little bit more, and the um, residential class will have a, a little bit of a smaller tax rate. On the other side, um, which is not unheard of, but not very common, um, you can do a factor greater than one, which reduces the residential, um, excuse me, reduces the commercial, industrial, and personal property tax rate, and it increases the um, residential tax rate. Um, so again, something what to think about when deciding whether to do a single or uh, split tax rate is um, a recommendation from the Department of Revenue, which says it's best to keep a single rate unless you have 25% commercial industrial personal property versus your residential um, or more, of course, if you have a much higher rate, then that's that's fine. Um, so again, back to that last slide with the number of 12.3% uh, with the commercial industrial and personal property class versus the 88.5% for residential. Next slide. So these are some of the um, estimated impacts. So on average, our single family home uh, right now is $539,333 in value. Um, so if we did a single tax rate at $17.82 per thousand, the average single tax rate would be about $9,600. Whereas if we decided to do a split tax rate um, with a $16.65 tax rate for residential class, we'd be looking at about $8,900 for the average um, the bill. So this is a decrease of about three, uh, $631. Keep in mind when we talk about the commercial class, the impact of the increase. Um, so in the commercial class, the average commercial value is $630,963. So looking at that same single tax rate of $17.82, the average tax bill would be about $11,200. Whereas if we did a split tax rate, their tax rate would be $26.72 versus the residential class at $16.65, putting their tax bill at $16,800 on average. So that's a difference of $5,615.57. So that's quite a bit of an increase to do that split. And then again, thinking about that 12% of properties that we would be affecting. Um, so just a little, just a little thought there. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the other exemptions that we are able to vote on tonight is the residential exemption. So this exemption shifts the um, tax burden within the residential class. So the commercial and industrial classes are not affected by this at all. So basically what happens is we can shift up to 35% of the average residential property value uh, in a dollar amount, not specifically to each and every property. It's the average value. Um, we can go up to 35% and reduce that from owner-occupied properties. 
Um, so again, this just moves around the funds within the residential classes. This does benefit those um, who are residential and owner occupied. Um, but those who are who are not owner occupied would not get this exemption. And if we can go to the next slide, we can talk about qualifications and non qualifications for this property. So qualifications, single family homes, condominiums, parts of two and three families and mixed use properties, uh, parts of those as well. So the non owner occupied properties, uh, second homes and rentals, um, uh, apartment complexes, um, homes that are rented by family members. So for example, um, you know, a student comes to town and their parents own their house, um, but they live in it, still their family, they would not qualify for the exemption. Same thing goes for uh, a parent purchases a property for, for their child or children, but they also live in town and their children live in that house. That house is not eligible for the exemption. Um, another thing that's really, really important to think about with that one is parents who are aging and decide to give their children their house. They live there, they pay all the bills, they you know maintain, they do not qualify for this exemption because they are not on the deed. And it doesn't matter if they have a life estate, they do not qualify. So um, some things to think about if we do decide to go this route at some point, um, we need to make sure that we look into who we're helping and who we're hurting. Um, and then of course, nursing homes and groups home, group homes would not qualify for that as well. Next slide, please. Um, and then this just shows the difference between the owner occupied and the non owner occupied properties. I don't want to say that this is a perfect number because there's always somebody out there who's forgotten to change their address. Um, but the information that we have, we have about 60, 67% properties in town that are owner occupied. And again, this is just the residential. This has nothing to do with the commercial, industrial and personal property as well. Um, and then again, the 33% of properties that are not owner occupied. Next slide, please. And so just a summary again of the residential ex exemption that we will be voting on tonight is that it's basically just a redistribution of the tax levy among the residential properties. So um, again, it won't have any effect on the commercial, industrial, and personal property. Um, it's kind of a misnomer because it says that it's a a tax break for some, but it's not a tax break for others. Um, so we just have to be mindful of, you know, if we do decide to do this, um, you know, larger homes may end up paying more, whereas smaller homes may end up um, with a little bit more of a break. Um, and then it also tends to penalize, as I sort of touched on a little bit with the older folks who have put their, their homes in a trust or have given them to their children. Um, it also penalizes our low income renters because the apartments don't qualify for this. So this would go really for any types of renters, um, whether it's renting a single family home, whether it's renting a, an apartment out of a large apartment complex, assuming that bills increase, that slowly trickles down to the tenant. And so with the lower income, with the seniors, with whomever is renting, this is not going to help them whatsoever. Uh, because we assume again, that the costs will be passed on to the, to them. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so the other exemption that I had mentioned that we would talk about tonight that we do need to vote on is the small commercial exemption. So we wouldn't need to vote this, um, we wouldn't need to pass this, that is, um, unless we did decide to do a split tax rate. Um, basically, the requirements are to have um, less than 10 employees and have their assessed valuation be less than a million dollars. Um, and again, very similar to the residential um, exemption, this is just a shift within the commercial, industrial, and personal property um, tax base where, um, you know, this business is getting a little bit of a discount. Um, they would pay the residential rate rather than the commercial rate, but this business then has to make it up. So again, just a little shift um, in that. And um, Honestly, it really doesn't benefit the small businesses who don't own their buildings because again, like the apartments, if the rent or if the cost of the building is going up, if the taxes are going up, we assume that trickles down to the rent. So again, with the small businesses, that would be the same for them as well. Next slide, please. So my recommendation tonight is to adopt a single tax rate. 
um, so a factor of one, to not adopt the small commercial um, exemption or open space exemption and to not adopt the residential exemption as well. Any questions? We're gonna start with questions from the council and then we'll move to a public uh, comment period. Uh, Pam Rooney. Thank you, I've got a couple questions. Um, uh, first of all, I saw that mixed use buildings, the residential portion of a mixed use building is considered owner occupied. And I'm very curious why that's the case. Um, your, your diagram showed that 66% of the properties are owner occupied, but that doesn't equal 66% of the dwelling units in town. And I wonder if we could get a number of the actual total dwelling units in town today as of now and that's obviously broken down by the number that you have counted that are owner occupied the remainder would be the dwelling uh, rental units um i i have a a long standing question that has to do with valuation and when i think of um i'm i'm comfortable with a single tax rate that's not the concern but my my concern really lies in the valuation and the valuation, um, when I think of a commercial property, I don't know how you incorporate the books, the, the income that's generated in that building, how does that factor into the, the, form, the formula for a value for the building? My question is, can there be a comparable formula developed for income residential? We know that a lot of units in town are, are not owner occupied and they are in fact income generating properties. So even if we have a single tax rate, how can we incorporate income as a factor in valuing those properties? I think it would change our tax base a lot. Sure. Um, so to answer your first question, why the mixed use p portion would be included in the residential exemption. So that's a tricky one because we would have to figure out exactly what unit the owner occupies and whatever that square footage would be, would be where the exemption would come from. Um, so that one would be much more complex. They're usually rental. So if they were rentals, then they would not be included in that. Yes. Um, so to get to um, the total dwelling units and, and numbers uh, between how many properties we actually have and how many are owner occupied. I can get those figures for you. I won't be able to provide those tonight, um, but I can certainly email those to you. Um, and then the question about the income and expense. This is one that I have gotten a number of times. Um, and although, you know, I agree that it is frustrating that it feels like people are making profit off of single family homes, two family homes, so on and so forth. The Department of Revenue has us classify property by single family, two family, three family, so on and so forth. And the only residential property that we are able to use income and expense method on is the apartment buildings. The reason for that is because there isn't often sales of large apartment complexes of four or more. Um, obviously those are not owner occupied and those do have the income and expense statements. Whereas anything less than four, has, when we do our sales analysis at the end of the year, if we don't have enough sales in the calendar year that we're looking at, we can go back a year and we'll get what we need. Um, and so the Department of Revenue would much prefer that we look at the sales data. Um, they have said that we cannot split the class because um, if we are to use the income and expense method on single family homes, most of our um, properties are, are owner occupied and there would be no income and expense. So it would completely skew our data. They would also say, what are you doing? Why are you not using sales? You have tons of them. Um, so unfortunately, as frustrating as that is, um, you know, there is, there is some guidelines from the department of revenue that, that don't allow us to do that. Um, when using the income and expense, I think to answer another part of that question um, for the commercial, industrial, um, and apartment complexes, we 
pool the information. So we send out a request in the beginning of the year, whatever comes back in for information, um, you know, we, we pool that together and we look at it as a whole. Um, and with that being said, what I mean is we look at all the apartment complexes of four or more, and we look at the in income and expense that we receive. And then we do it of um, all the apartment complexes of eight or more. And we look at the information that we have there. If there's an outlier, if there's an apartment complex that's given us some information that's really high or really low, either either direction, we will look specifically at that building and say, is there something happening at this building? Um, and this goes the same for commercial property and industrial as well. Um, but we'll look specifically at that building and say, you know, is it in a part of town that's like really fancy? Is it brand new? Does it have all these really fancy things? Is that why the rent is so much higher here? Um, you know, I hate to blame anyone, but is it close to UMass? Is that maybe why? Or is it close to Amherst College and maybe it has a lot of um, student income and it's just a lot of turnover and, you know, whatever the reason is. And then we look at the other side of it for the same thing. You know, why is this apartment complex not making a whole lot of money? Is is it maybe run down? Like what's happened to it? Um, but but specifically overall, we just we don't look at those individuals and we we come up with um an area of where we would like to be based upon that information. Recently, I have um, been aware of some sales of properties of specifically apartment complexes that are outside of our town. And those are things that we're able to look at too because they don't happen that often. Um, so that's something that's also um, you know playing a role in that as well. Okay, uh, Bob Hagner. Yes, I had a question about personal property. Um, I pay per personal property taxes on my automobile. Is that taxed the same rate as my house? No. So personal property with uh, vehicles versus actual equipment is a little different. Um, so excise tax is taxed in lieu of personal property on vehicles because we have them registered through the registry of motor vehicles. Um, for example, if you had a whole bunch of really fancy old cars in your yard and you didn't have any of them registered, then you would pay a personal property tax. Um, so the vehicle tax is $25 per thousand, and that depreciates with the age of your vehicle. Uh, or I shouldn't say the $25 depreciates, but the depreciation is based on the age of your vehicle. Um, whereas personal property items, like for example, the desk, the computer, those things, those have a different scale. Those will follow either the single tax rate or the split tax rate with the commercial rate. You're welcome. Okay. Councilor Atta. This is a question for my edification. Um, let's suppose the council votes for a split rate. What would the process be to determine what the factor would be? Sure. So um, what, if we decided that we wanted to do a split tax rate, uh, we would first of all not need to start talking much earlier than tonight. Um, but also we would... Um, hopefully anyway, that is. Um, but what we would do is we would look at our figures. What, what are our values? What is the amount of money um, that we need to collect through the town? We can put in figures. What is our excess um, levy? What it, you know, all of these things. What, it, what are all the actual figures that we have early on in the season? We put them into the gateway program that is through the Department of Revenue. And then we can guesstimate what that tax rate looks like. Once we get our values certified, which we have to do in order to get to tonight, um, it gives us a little more of a, once we get closer to that, we can get a little bit more of a perfect figure of what we think the tax rates would be. And then of course we can present those like we do tonight. If it's something that we're very interested in doing, I can put in the certain factors, um, you know, if we wanna do a really small shift or if we wanna do a large shift of the 1.5, which is the max, I could give you those figures um, so that you can decide on what exactly the factor would be that you would want to split the rate. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Um, I attended a webinar today um, that in the comments section of that webinar, it was on ADU, so it has nothing to do with tax classification. Um, but in the comment section, someone had written a comment that I haven't been able to find or verify, but there was a comment that said the, there was a recent court decision that indicated that short-term rentals were commercial uses that declared them commercial uses, not residential uses. So Airbnb type rentals. 
Um, I don't know whether that was for zoning purposes only or not, but if that is the case, and there's a lot of qualifications in this comment, <laughs> but if that is the case, would that allow us to move short-term rentals into the CIP section of our tax classifications instead of the residential section, presumably treating them similar to, I assume, hotels are in the CIP section, not the residential section. Um, would we be able to do that? And then would we be able to define what a short-term rental is? I know there's a state definition that doesn't seem to have like a number of days or what type of lease you need or anything, but um, know anything about that or how we might? That's the first I've heard. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, first thing would be to find out if that's true and, and what that actually reads. Um, and then I think that would be in determining what is the short-term lease, that would probably be something that we'd also have to look into. And I'm sure there would be some discussion with um, the inspections team as well. Um, you know, if this is something that is coming down the pipeline, um, just thinking about it off the top of my head, I feel like this could be really difficult and time consuming for us, but um, something that seems doable because I know, you know, inspections has lists of rental properties. And so, um, you know, we'd have to work with them closely to figure that out. And I'm sure there's probably some way in our system that we'd be able to do this, but I can't say yes or no, if that's coming or not. <laughs> no, a, a follow-up. Um, we have a short-term, we've adopted the local option for short-term rentals, uh, sales taxes like, or occupancy taxes or whatever they call it for short-term rentals. So do we have, given that local option, do we actually have a list of short-term rentals that fit into that category? That if it is the case that short-term rentals are considered commercial, that we would then be able to at least move those into the commercial side. I don't know how many we have, but if we've got a listing of that, if all of this is there, would we or should we move those short-term rentals if we can into the commercial side of tax classification? Yeah, um, I, you know, I don't want to speak for the inspections department because I don't know, but I would assume if that has been enforced that they would absolutely have that list. Um, I have all these thoughts now of how this might happen, but I, you know, I think this would certainly take some time. And I think that the Department of Revenue would have to guide us on this because they do guide us on how to classify each property. Um, and something that I think is, is sort of going back just a bit to the use of the single family homes and the, you know, the rentals and, and things like that. The way, and this answers a little bit of your question too, but the way that we have to value property is not necessarily who lives there. It's how the property is being used. And by that doesn't mean an occupant, an owner occupant or a rental. It's just, is it a residence? Is it commercial? So this could bring some, I would think if this passed, if this is really something that's happened, this is going to take a while to trickle down to us because I think the DOR would have some work to do before employing this to all of us. Okay. Anna? I think I have the really loud microphone again. Sorry. It's like echoing too. Is it, I'm gonna keep going if I'm... George has saved me. Okay. Um, I had a similar comment to Mandy. I was reading a report um, oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this. I was reading a report on progressive tax rates today, um, which is so weird. Uh, and it was talking about actually, uh, Mandy, one of the towns that has done what you're talking about is Provincetown. And I think that part of this, um, I'm sure you knew that, but part of this is that the definition of, of short-term rental and the definition of seasonal community kind of bite Amherst a little, right? Like we do have a large seasonal community, but our seasonal community doesn't count in the same way that the Cape, the Vineyard, you know, et cetera, those, those seasonal communities count because they're swapped. Um, and so I, I do think that Provincetown's case is really interesting for two reasons. That is the first reason. The second is that Provincetown passed a, I think it was a home rule um, for property tax exemptions for rental properties used as affordable housing, which I think was a really interesting way to approach a, a different type of exemption. Obviously that's not something you would do like right now for us, but it'd be something the council would have to work 
for and get past. Um, but I, I thought that that was an interesting approach because if we want to switch towards this idea of a rental exemption, how are we also making sure we're protecting the people who would be most adversely impacted by a residential exemption? And I don't think we can, I guess I will speak for myself. I don't think I could ethically go for one without doing the other. So I couldn't vote for a, a residential tax exemption without some sort of protection for affordable units or affordable housing. Um, but I do think that could be a really interesting way to go down the road. The other option um, is a bit more roundabout, but just I will spare you all reading this uh, article on progressive tax rates. They talked about also petitioning the state to combine commercial and industrial into one category, because as per our constitution, we can only have four types of tax categories. I, mean, I know I'm getting this all wrong, but I know the four, four is the key number. Um, and so you can change them, but you can't, you could like change what they are, but you can't add more than four. You can't have more than four. So weird. So we could combine commercial, we could petition our state legislators to petition the governor to petition all of these changes um, to then add in an affordable housing exemption as one of the four full-time uh, permanent exemptions, which I do think is also an interesting thing for folks on this council to consider as we advocate to our state legislators. Um, but I do think the, the Provincetown example is interesting if folks are inclined to look towards that residential exemption, I would encourage us to pursue this path first. And if you have any thoughts on this uh, word jumble that I just threw out there, I'm happy to hear them. Thank uh, you. I think I think the only thing that I can really respond with is just basic, basically um, the residential exemption, the intention of that when it was first created was for the Cape. Um, it was for people who lived on the Cape and were getting basically priced out because people were coming and building these gigantic homes and paying absorbent amount of money for these little tiny homes that they were then knocking down or, you know, so on and so forth. So it's just kind of interesting um, that other towns are now considering this in other areas of Massachusetts. Um, I had done a presentation at one point giving more specifics about how many towns had the residential exemption. Um, and I don't recall the exact number, but um, it was a very small number of of the cities and towns, and they were really more out east towards the Cape. Um, Sorry, like can I just, can I, I, I actually just had that pulled up of the residential exemptions. The report's a little bit old, but in 2020, it was 16 point something percent, but those towns accounted for 18% of the Massachusetts population, which was really interesting. Um, I just wanna make sure we clarify, regardless of, who pays at what percent, we still can only tax up to two and a half percent. So we can collect up to two and a half percent of what we collected last year. Right. And so the valuations can fluctuate more than two and a half percent, but the total amount collected can only be that unless we do an override or a debt exclusion. Right. So in other words, we're not gaining more money by taxing Correct. one group higher and another group lower. Correct. We're just Basically, shifting the burden. It's a shift. Okay. And if we do do the single tax rate, values go up, tax rate goes down, and vice versa. Right. Generally speaking, of course, there's always things that happen, but um, but that's the general. Okay. Uh, I'm going to now open for public comment. If you're in the room and you want to make public comment, please make sure that you've gone over here and registered. And if you're in the audience on Zoom and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand uh, at this time. Um, point of order clarification. This is just on tax this classification on tax and there will be another general public comment period. That is correct. Andy, you had a question? No. Oh. This is just on tax classification, okay? Um, I see one hand. Please come forward, state your name and where you live. And maximum of three minutes. Yep. So, um, Vincent O'Connor, um, one seventy-five Summer Street, Apartment Twelve. Um, so, first, I want to correct a statement that was made earlier in the evening about tenants not paying taxes. We all, every tenant in this town, pays taxes. I just that statement should not be made again. It's incorrect. 
misleading and it, it it's not good for the public discussion of taxation of residential property. Second, this is this vote comes uh, somewhat earlier than it usually does. And I and I've heard some very interesting um, comments. And I think that it's probably worthwhile to postpone this discussion to another meeting so that some of the suggestions and ideas that have been presented can be evaluated and you can hear back from the principal assessor. Uh, third, I want to make a point about the um, affordable units in town. The affordable units don't only consist of units that are embedded in properties like Rolling Green, North Square, and so forth, uh, the housing authority units, but there are also units that are subsidized under various programs, uh, the Section 8 program and so forth, where um, essentially there is there is government money going into those units, but, and, and there are people who, who actually, and I know of one, a neighbor, that has consistently taken a loss to, to um, rent out at Section 8 prices to families. So I think that um, that's, that's an issue that when you think about doing that, you don't want to be taxing the, the, the payments that are already made by another government agency. So I, I just would urge the, the council to consider taking this up where some of the comments that's been made can be explored and you can have a, a get some, some of the answers to the questions that have been raised and perhaps, and, and, and also explore the impact of farmers on farmers, which is negative for some of the proposals, so some of the exemptions that could Please be conclude. granted or changes. So I think it's all those, for all those reasons, I just would urge the council to um, consider this at, at, an, at another meeting so that some of the issues that have been raised can be explored. Don't put it off till another year because they'll be forgotten. Thank, Thank you. you for your comments. Are there any other public comments at this time? Okay. Are there any other counselor questions? Okay. Then I'm going to make a motion to close the class tax classification hearing and seek a second. 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 Motion's been made and seconded. I'll begin the vote with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, aye. You made Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Todd. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Damn. Aye. It's unanimous. The hearing has been closed. Um, we are now going to move to general public comment. Anyone wishing to speak who is in the town room, if you have not signed up, please do so with Athena. If you are on Zoom and you wish to make general public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Athena, we have one. Thank you. Two. We have two. Thank you. Public comments on matters are on matters within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. Please call the first person. Uh, Vince, we just heard from you, so I'm going to call on Allegra, and then we can come back to you, okay? Allegra Clark, please. Is 
Do I have to press the button? You do. It needs to be green. If it's, it's green, green okay. then you're fine. All right. uh, my name's Allegra Clark. I am a resident of District 2. Um, I just wanted to come tonight. I know that the financial indicators portion of the evening was earlier. I've just been thinking a lot about the schools lately as a mother of a second grader at Wildwood. I just kind of wanted to give you a picture of what's been going on there. Um, our second grade has about 60 students in it right now. And today was the first day that they were split into three classrooms instead of two. So up until Friday, there were 26 seven and eight year olds in my son's classroom. And it was a little bit chaotic to say the least. Um, so I say that because I think about the chronic reductions in budget that we've seen over the years and how that, how that impacts the staffing in the schools and in turn, how that impacts the well-being of the, and safety of the students in the classroom. Um, so I'm grateful for the uh, school, school committee members who came tonight and kind of had some questions about surpluses and how we can work together to make sure that the budget isn't as severely underfunded as it's projected to be right now, because that would be devastating. Um, and I, I know um, from talking to other parents that Crocker Farm also has had to, to add an additional kindergarten this year. So although it's not like indicative of like, oh no, everything's great, enrollment's going back up. Like there are, we are seeing that class sizes are getting so big that they, there have needed to be additions um, in certain areas. So I do wanna put that at the front of people's minds. Um, I also just, I have a question and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but last week there was a big house move that really impacted the schools and the town. Um, residents didn't have access to heat, electricity, um, cable utilities and internet, um, which could impact their working. So I'm just wondering if there's like a fee or a permit that gets, um, you know, if there's an associated cost that goes along with moving a house. And if there's not, I think there should be, because this is not the first time that this has happened on a school day that impacted um, students learning. And I think that we got a message about when it should be expected to be over. And it went about like, I think seven hours past the time that was allotted. So perhaps there could be like a house moving fee overage per minute, like when you don't pick your child up from uh, after school on time um, so that we could offset some of the impacts to residents that those things happen because um, it was pretty significant for a lot of people in town. So those are my two cents. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I encourage you to send an email with your questions. Um, that concludes public comment. I'm sorry, Vince. I'm sorry. Come on up. Again, Vincent O'Connor, 175 Summer Street, um, apartment 12. Um, so I sat through the discussion about the, in, the revenue discussion about free, uh, as a prelude to the town budget earlier. I also sat through both of the four town meetings that uh, were referred to during that discussion. At no time during that, those two meetings, did the, and I'm talking here about the, the man on the third floor, not the women on the first floor. At no time during those discussions where Amherst uh, representatives uh, pled for did the man on the third floor mention that in multiple years, the budget surpluses have been around $5 million. Maybe he, he didn't mention it to the finance committee either. And if I were on the finance committee, I would feel humiliated and angry for having not been having this pointed out by the man on the third floor. 
This is an outrageous, quite frankly, false and dishonest misrepresentation of the town's financial resources by the man on the third floor. Absolutely false, absolutely dishonest. And quite frankly, if I were the parent of a child in either the elementary or the secondary schools, I would call my city councilor and demand that they get rid of him. This is an unacceptable situation. This is not a one year, $5 million extraordinary situation. This is a multiple year situation. And this, the council should not tolerate this at all. The, there should be an end to all the, 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 the cry poor the council and it points out a very significant flaw in this in the in this city's charter to have a a single person who who supervises one third of the budgetary expenditures in this town having control over over the entirety of the budget the schools If there is a structural problem in this charter, it is that. And, and those who knew should be ashamed of themselves for allowing the man on the third floor to continually misrepresent the town's financial position. That concludes general public comment. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. And let me just point out before we begin the consent agenda that there are various items on the consent agenda that still will be discussed later, okay? So even if we're going to refer items, there's opportunity to discuss those items. The two items, there are two items, however, are actually, um, I'll, I'll point them out when we go through here but on the consent agenda that basically means, yes, you've approved them. And if you don't want to approve them without any changes, then you need to have them pulled off the consent agenda. Okay. So I'll point them out as we go along. Yeah. So the consent agenda basically is a combination of either approvals or referrals. Okay. If you are not prepared to approve something that's on the consent agenda, then you need to make sure you ask that it be pulled off. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Um, so the items were, uh, as they have been in the past, uh, selected because they were thought to be non-controversial, not necessarily true. So I'm gonna make a motion. And again, if you would like to remove something, wait until I finish the whole thing, and removing something does not require a second. Okay. So to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 8A, adoption of a residential factor of one, equal tax rate and no open space discount for FY25. 8A, to not adopt a residential exemption for FY25. 8A, to not adopt a small commercial exemption for FY25. I just want to point out all three of those are votes that finish the discussion, okay? The next one is to rescind authorization, is 8B, to rescind authorization but unused debt as presented in the memo regarding, um, it actually should be as presented in the financial order, uh, FY25. 25-13, rescinding authorized but unused bond date. It's dated October 31st. It's on page eight of the motion sheet. Again, that's a once and done, once we vote, agenda the consent, that's approving them. 8C1-7 to seven is a referral of appropriations outside the budget to the finance committee. And that's where the real meat of the meeting is, is in this area. 
And then 9A1 is approval of town manager appointments to the Water Supply Protection Committee. It's a reappointment of Stephen Kurtz for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. That was approved by uh, TS. Yeah. I'm sorry. Recommended. It was recommended, yes, by the committee. Thank you. Are there any items that you would like removed? Pam? I'd like to remove 8B, the recession of authorized but unissued debt. Okay. Are there any other requests? Okay, so then the motion is as read before, but no longer includes 8B to rescind authorized but unused debt. Any other comments or questions? I'll second it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Required. Uh, we'll begin with Councilor Ate. Aye. Lynn Greesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous. All right. So we're done with tax classifications. And we are going to move to the rescission. I, I assume you have, everybody has asked all the questions they want to with regard to tax classification. Is there anything else? At some point, if the council does want to explore or have explored some other alternative, that needs to be done with enough lead time so that before we come to an actual uh, proposal, you have a, we have an opportunity to really seriously look at that. Any questions regarding that? Pam, you have your hand up. Pam, Rooney, you have your hand up. Okay, okay, Bob Hagner. Yeah, I just want, I want uh, to request that any um, such motions or ideas about um, tax rates be referred to the Finance Committee. Absolutely, totally. Um, okay, Pam, you still have your hand up? Well, I had a question about 8B with the rescissions, but if we haven't gotten there yet, I'll take my hand down. No, no, we're, we're getting there, so just leave it on up, okay? All right, the uh, next item is 8B, in fact, and the motion under 8B is to adopt council order FY25-13, rescinding authorized but unused bonds as shown on page eight of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Pam, you asked that this be removed. Please speak to your request. Thank you. It, it was unclear to me uh, that this is either money being returned, the use of the word unissued bonds, meaning we actually did not borrow that money. Is that correct? Or is this money that um, was borrowed fully and is now available for something else? The question that I really have then is if it's money being returned to what pot does this money go into as a rescission? We have our finance director here to answer these questions. Thank you. So this is money that was not borrowed. Those projects um, came in at a lower amount and we borrowed only the money necessary for those projects and any unused amount or in the two of the cases, those projects didn't go forward at all. So we're rescinding the authorization to give us the opportunity to authorize bonds for projects that we are going to complete. And so there's no money going back. Okay. So it was never borrowed. It was never borrowed. Thank you. Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, just stay there for a second. So um, that was very clear explanation. Um, on the capital budget, we're given each year interest and carrying costs on authorizations, including expected that we think we're going to borrow it. So when we rescind this way, does that chain change that? You know, so if we thought we were going to borrow two million dollars and we only borrowed a million and a half, a uh, carrying cost should go down somewhere. Right. So my assumption, honestly, ha having done my first capital project here yet, is that we um, re um, we reallocate those years of debt um, based on the new assumptions at the time. So from year to year, we get uh, different interest rates. 
So we would change the forecast based on current and updated interest rate and current and updated costs of the project going up or down. So just on, so it might, this might affect the current year we're looking at the actual capital budget. The actual capital budget spending has been coming in lower than when we projected because we haven't moved forward on a couple of the big buildings. So we've been you know, saying we're gonna do this. So would it potentially generate a surplus in this year's cap expected capital? because we didn't have to finance that money. So, so these projects, I don't believe, are in that forecast because those are old projects that hadn't been forecast in a while. Um, but like, for, for instance, if we were, um, I know that um, in a few weeks, we'll be looking at you know the four major projects, which we talked about a lot today. Um, and so those, they've moved, they've moved years out. They, it's not nearly necessarily savings, but the money that we thought maybe we're going to spend in 26 maybe won't be started till 27 or 28. I'm just asking a couple of these were fairly big rescissions and whether they were built into the forecasts of debt service or not, did, did some of that go down? And I it's, think it's going to be nuanced because none of these were at the million range. Yeah. Right. So I think one was the parking lot where the park now is. So I don't think that that was in the forecast at all. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. then, um, thank you. Okay. So, in other words, there's no extra money out there, Kathy. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it is answering that if it never was booked in any way, I mean, right. we booked like we're buying this piece of equipment and then we never bought it or it came in cheaper. Right. We, we got it on the edge, but not never doing it at all. Yeah. Example, Holly, please go oh. ahead. Go ahead, Holly. I'm sorry. Um, so, for example, the um, it, and I'm I'm just going to simplify it very much. So, the I believe the Northampton Road water main was projected at two million dollars. We authorized two million dollars. When all was said and done, there was cost sharing with the state. There things came in different in the bids. We only spent one point two million dollars of that. So, we've only been accounting for that one. Point two million dollars for the last couple, the last fiscal year and the current fiscal year, because we sort of knew it was already going to be capped there. So that eight hundred thousand wasn't projected out because we hadn't borrowed for it, we hadn't done a, a bond anticipation. No, we hadn't had any costs on that. So it, it's not going to really increase what is available for new capital because we had already reduced that probably in the last fiscal year. Thanks. Okay. Thank you both. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, we're going to move to a vote. Councillor, uh, no, it's me. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councilor Rette. Aye. It's unanimous. Okay. Now we're going to have a presentation on the supplemental budget appropriation request. Is that correct, Paul? Are we or do we just want to go through each one and ask questions? However, you would like to do it. Okay. Um, no, we don't have a, we don't have a PowerPoint or anything like okay. that. We've already voted the referral. Okay, and in your packet is a document that both explains them and attaches all of the financial orders. Let me just start by saying: Are there any questions on financial order FY twenty five dash twelve A, an order appropriating? from free cash to stabilization funds for reparations and capital. Councillor Haneke. So if you do it by these, I'm not sure where some of my questions fit. Okay. Um, right. <laughs> do you have so an overall I, question? I'm gonna put them in this one because I think this is the one that would change my questions okay, get answered a certain way. Yes. Um, but but number one that doesn't fit into any of these is 
I'd like an update on the status of returning that five million to the capital stabilization fund for the elementary school project, given bid statuses and well, bid projections. Now I, I know we're not signed or anything, but given all the projections going on, what's the status of getting five million that we had authorized to move out back in for that project? But um, I know that's not really related to these at all, but, but it came fine. up. It's a good um, question. <laughs> we had. Five and a half, five point seven million in all of these financial orders um, that are being transferred in various ways. Um, some are being used uh, per the guidelines. Others are adding to capital. Um, given what we saw in the financial indicators and it, your comment in the financial indicators that the free cash, you know, you aim for about five percent of the budget. That that seems like a good number of surplus every year. Um, this year's was six, not five. Mm -hmm. um, at what point do we consider not putting all of the excess um, of that surplus into capital projects or capital stabilization fund? Because that's basically what it is. F12A is capital stabilization, but all the other ones, five, whatever those numbers are, are capital projects. Mm -hmm. um, at what point do we say, or should we consider um, things like keeping 6% in free cash so that 1% in free cash every year can get budgeted into the next year's operating budget for operating support? Um, and I know that's not necessarily part of our current fiscal plan, but when should we think about doing something like that or adding to our um adding to the next year's fine budget and saving some to support the next year's budget to be able to add stuff in some sense it's what the schools do now we see their budgets at least the region and the region almost always um budgets E and D into its op operating budget. Northampton does it a little bit too, although the way they do it, I think is kind of wonky and hard to explain. But um, um, at what point do we consider that? And then the next question that I have is, we in last year's financial guidelines for the FY25 budget put in that um, you should put money in for the charter review committee to potentially hire a consultant. I thought we had asked those questions early on that that money was there in the FY25 budget. Um, I have been told it might not be in the FY25 budget so that the committee doesn't have the money to hire a consultant or do outreach or anything like that. And so should we be considering um, using some of this money that You've you've got some put to waste hauling and other things. If there isn't money in the budget for consultant review for charter review committee, consultant hiring, should we be seeking an additional financial order or be asking or modifying on the fly? Could we modify this one on the fly, which is why I'm asking it on this one, to reduce the capital stabilization fund number from 3.9-ish million to 3. .9 nine-ish million for consultant and add another line in to spend for consultant. Mm -hmm. So that that's some of the questions, but I guess the other overarching question is, why did you pick those capital projects and not others sure. too? You guys can join if you want. So um, whether we have 5%, 5% seems to be a reasonable number, um, as I said, and, and we are a little bit better, better depends how you define it, uh, whether we're better or worse because of that. Um, the, um, in terms of the charter, I, I, I just missed that one. If we were supposed to include that, we just didn't. And there's still, we can still do that. Obviously free cash is there all year long. And we've appropriated from as we appropriated funds from the, from free cash for the track, for instance, last year, um, pardon me, a gift, right. Um, in terms of, um, why these two these items i mean we've been doing extra money we've always said we'd like to do more money in roads um sort of outside the capital uh, the 10.5 percent 
because that's all the council has always identified roads as a major investment requirement or request. So anytime we have a little bit of elbow room, we try to, I offer that up to the council to see if you still want to do that. The, um, the, and we, we, I'm sure we're going to talk about all of these, the, um, you know, the, um, money for the waste hauler, it's a bigger number than we probably need, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, we just put that number there. We'll have more refined numbers before the council actually votes on it. So we'll know exactly what we think we need for that. Uh, that's a, a council initiative in essence. Um, for the um, the uh, snow plow, this track, this, the sidewalk plow, uh, that was a request that was before the Joint Capital Planning Committee last year and rejected. Um, since that time, there have been equipment failures with some of the equipment that for DPW, um, they have, they're down to one sidewalk plow. So the question is, we will be able to do what we can do with the equipment we have. If we get a second equipment, we'll be able to do more. And so it's and the, and the timeliness of it for now, as opposed to waiting till next, next fiscal year, next sort of capital programming is that we have winter coming up. So I think that's the type of question we can explore more with the finance committee when it sort of takes it into consideration. Um, why are we putting money aside? It's the reason we put money aside is to start to build that capital fund so that we can uh, smooth out, as I think Melissa said during her presentation, smooth out the, the four capital projects over time. So when it does spike, with we use, we'll use we have this money to, to shave it off. The other piece was to, um, we were trying to build up enough cash to pay for the fire station in cash. That was our big thing. We we're saving up money to pay for the fire station. Um, and so we didn't have to go out to borrow for that. And so building that reserve is, and it's a risky thing because it's a big number. It sits there, everybody points at it and says, why do you have so much money sitting there? And we said, we're trying to buy a fire station with it. Um, Holly or Melissa, do you want to add anything to that? Um, so I will say that, um, you know, what we're trying to do um, is build that capital stabilization back up. And, you know, as you noted, the $5 million um, was taken out for a different capital project than, than was the plan originally for the, you know, the f other uh, projects. But um, I, I didn't, I was unaware of any uh, initiative to put that back. Um, but I, but what I was thinking about was to to build it back um, so that we we were back to the same levels we were two years ago before it was taken away. And then to build on that to um, to and to your point, it does the the way that it would flow into the budget, should we build it up and then um, use it to pay for capital is that the, the plan that um, Sandy worked on, um, before I was here was to build up that capital stabilization and not um, pay cash as much for it because I think the amount of cash that is needed to do a building at this time is way more than we should have on hand. Um, but to have enough that we can um, flow into the budget for the debt um, portion, which is part of our capital, 10 and a half percent. So it would uh, increase th that um, percentage of capital spending but not from current year revenues and be able to make it not look like we're jumping from 10% to 20%, um, but that that money is gonna come and be um, fed into the budget, not for operating costs, but for capital. And it's been my um, practice um, um, and it has been the advice of financial advisors that I've worked with that free cash is considered one-time money because we did well, you can say we did really poorly on our estimates or we did really well on our estimates this year, however you want to look at it, but that surplus doesn't come every single year. Um, and so, um, like Holly mentioned earlier, we did extraordinarily well with interest this year. Um, it is unlikely that we'll be able to repeat that. Interest rates have already started to come down. We're already um, locking in at rates that are lower than what we previously had. And as soon as we start to spend this money, that we have on hand, we won't be able to make money on it anymore. So, so let me just add to that. So the, um, the the question, one of the questions is, if we don't need, the question is with the school project, do we borrow less money or, do, and that's, that's subject to the override, the debt exclusion, or do we 
return this money to the capital funds? That's really the, the sort of policy question that we'll have to decide on once we have what the numbers are and how we're going to finance it and how it's going to be bonded over time. So that, that's that's one of the key questions that we don't have a recommendation on at this point in time. Um, and then in, in terms of using money uh, for the for the ongoing operating expenses, you know, we could do that as a practice. Um, you just, it's, it's, it's a one, it's one time, it's spending, it's, it's like what we're doing with ARPA money. It's one time money. We can do, maybe you do it for three years in a row, but then at some point that dries up and we, and are we short on, on free cash and we can't support the operating budget. And that's, that's a bad place to be because you build your budget on recurring sources of, of revenue. And, but the $5 million is set aside and stays there unless it gets moved by the council to someplace else. But it's, it's just that $5 million is set aside. How is anything? Councilor Haneke, you asked a series of questions, and I want to make sure that we've addressed it. I'm good for now. Okay. Uh, Anna. It, you know, I'm C having. Kathy is ahead of me. Thank you. I will do that. It is my, in the curtains. My order is not showing it that way. Okay. Kathy. Thanks, because my hand is a different color than Anna's, no, it's, and it's in the, that's not the, and it's in it's, the curtains. I'm, I'm using so. my computer, not the screen up here. <laughs> so um, following up on Mandy did an overarching question. So I did have a question about the plow, and I'd like to hear more about it. We we an expensive plow was proposed in JCPC of 250, and now there's one at 200, and it didn't seem there were that many sidewalks. So why this piece of equipment rose to the top? So I, I would just like to hear more of it if it comes to finance. Um, the second one is the opioid. I'm not questioning that it needs to be set aside somewhat, but it's now accumulating. And if I did what we did last year, I'm not sure how much is in the total fund. What can we use that money for? It said for the right services. So I don't know what part it can provide a supplement to our operating budget. So as we accumulate it. So that's what I'm not sure it said, sequester it in its own place. And then just the last piece, Mandy is raising the question of pulling back the 5 million for the schools. The argument for taking it was lowering the tax impact on residents when the school hopefully starts to get built. And that most of that will come back once we do the geothermal and the solar. So it'll come back and that money would all come back to capital stabilization. So the money is due to come back. Um, I don't think we should move off that because there's a lot of nervousness in town. We're talking about how to spend the two and a half percent, which is actually a little bit more than two and a half for people on their tax budgets when they see them. And people are saying my taxes are already high. So I think there was a lot of goodwill we got by worrying about what the tax impact of the school would be. Um, and so any discussion of that, I think needs to be mixed with what's our forecast now. Interest rates are a little bit better than they were. Um, we don't know how much better. And we can't quite go out with that big bond authorization until we have a contract. And we don't have a contract yet. So there's this delay factor that's going on. So I think that's a, just a different, a very different issue. But I did want to talk about what rises to the top to spend some of that money on a project, as opposed to Mandy's idea of putting some of it back in an operating budget somewhere or some small amount um, that finances the next year's worth where we can see it. So we've never had that discussion. We've usually just usual. My, I've only been doing this for what, six years, seven years now, <laughs> whatever the number, <laughs> but we, the surpluses have just been uh, basically squirreled away, except when we did track and field, you know, we've put them out. So if I were talking about big projects, the roof of the high school and the roof of the middle school are leaking. So there are things that are kind of high on my list of urgent. So I think it's a, a bigger question of what rises to the top to wanna grab some of this money. Thanks. Um, Anna. Are, with Paul, did you have any comments or any of this? Yeah, I mean, I th um, 
in terms of, I think I tried to explain why, you know, the roads is, we, we since- I didn't question the roads so money. We, know we, we, need, we, we were cutting it. back on it. Um, yeah. And I think that, that the timeliness of it, we go out to bid in the winter for roads for next year. The same with the, the sidewalk plow, um, the equipment failure mate and the timeliness of that. And you may, the council may say, we still don't want it and that's okay. Um, the um, opioid money is allowed, is, is designated to be spent on, uh, it's supposed to be directed by people who have suffered from the um, from opioid abuse. And so we are part of a bigger coalition of communities in Hampshire County um, that's working through uh, putting money together to come up with um, programs uh, and, um, to address that. It doesn't stop at our border. Every community has, a, has some, some communities that get very little and they can't really do much. So the uh, approach is that you put everything together with Northampton and, and Amherst and our health director is part of that decision-making process. And we can get an accounting of that for you for sure. So just maybe we in finance, cause I just ha don't have a sense as we put money in, are we spending it also, or is it building we, up? We haven't spent any money. It's we've been, we've been spending it, okay. We have not been spending any, but there are currently some small projects and plans in place to start that planning process to get to the to the point where we we can spend it. But it can only be spent on um, substance abuse disorder programs. Um, you know, um, it, so it is restricted. Um, it has been building up because we have to have a public sort of process of who, where, why, what we should be spending this money on before we can start to spend it. And that is just all starting now. And so what came to my mind is, there, is there a clinical social worker who deals with addiction that could be a shared cost and paid for out of that fund that could work with our health and safety program? So it was just a, some way that it's out there, but it's a need we have that's cropping up in town that we have a person who's acting out, and part of the reason they're acting out is drug, the drugs they're taking, and they need to be stabilized. So, so that was just because it seems like a lot of money that we're uh, building up, and I had no idea where it's going. So, so it's money that has come from the pharmaceutical companies into the state. So it's not money that we are dedicating as money. No, it's great money. money. It's like the cigarette money. And, and then it, the, the cigarette reason, money went away. So the reason we did this is to account for it, make sure that's very clear to everybody where right. the money is and that what's being spent on. Yeah. Um, okay. Kathy, did you get all of your questions answered? Thank I, you. I did. Anna. All right. So I want to make sure I'm understanding some of, not all, but some of this money that we're looking at here is because we were conservative in our estimates last year, right? Uh, ish, yeah, okay. Um, but that conservative approach impacted the percentage allocated to the Amherst schools, the regional schools, the library and the town. So what I'm stuck on is why should the excess not be distributed in a similar way? Even if we said it has to be allocated towards capital, because I understand what you're saying about cash like this being used for operating, why wouldn't we have the discussion about allocating this to those different entities, given the budget decisions impact those? I, you are so ready to answer me and I can't wait. I'm so excited. And I'm truly like, I am truly seeking to understand here because I, I'm, right. if we're saying it should go to capital, we know they also have capital needs. Shouldn't, shouldn't it do that? Um, I'll pause. Cause I feel like you're ready to, to tell me exactly why. And I'm excited to learn. Which one of you wants to burst yeah. first? <laughs> I have a second one after this, but I want to hear this answer go, first. Holly, you go. Yeah, sure. Are you there? Yeah. Um, so pre-cash certification, pre-cash certification is for the general fund only. So the general fund operating budget does include the region, the schools, the town, and the library. Now, the way I'm gonna say this is, it may sound a little bit snarky, but what I really wanna say is the elementary schools, I mean, the Jones Library returned none of their appropriations, spent every penny. The regional school district spent every penny of their appropriation, did not return any money. Yeah. The elementary schools 
spent everything but $56,000, which flowed back into our free cash. That savings is from the general fund operations. It is from the town's $28 million general fund portion of the budget. So it, I, I don't want to say that it doesn't affect them in any way, shape, or form, but they didn't really contribute to a lot of that savings. And the reason why that money was saved was because it was okay saved on the general funds. Okay. I think that makes sense. So you're saying everybody budgeted conservatively, but they were closer to their lines in terms of their budgeting. Whereas we had X, we were able to stick to it or able to go more, whatever we it's staying in the line it came from. We saved more of our expenses to help contribute to that. We also had $4 million more of revenue. Uh, yeah, right, that makes sense. Which is which is a really large number as well, but. Um, and so a lot of that savings was due to vacancies. We had a lot of okay. vacancies in 2024 and if we took those away and didn't plan, then we couldn't um, restore positions that, you know, are what we deem to be essential here in the town. And so um, you don't, so part of the savings was just that we didn't have the appropriate staffing last year. And so we want to leave the money in the budget, yep. but it's a, a one-time saving because the hope is to restore um, those, those um, mm -hmm. positions. So the positions, like we saw that it was growing though in those growing numbers of that 213 positions, there were probably 199 positions actually filled in 2024 just because of turnover here in the town. That's super helpful. Thank you. Holly, what happened to the 56,000 from the, like, did that, you said that flowed back to them or is that part of this? And we should consider that possibly in our discussion. That flows back to the general fund. Okay. So portion of the general okay. fund. So it's part of what we're talking about when we talk about the appropriations now. It's it's all in a that portion. Of that is okay. There, correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I had a second question, but I'm gonna re. I'll go to the back of the no, line. No, no, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I appreciated Holly's phrase of I. This might sound snarky, and I and and for once, I don't actually intend it to. Um, one of the other questions that I had specifically. Wait, were you talking? Did you want us to? This is a specific. It, it seems to be very wide open. We're going anywhere. Okay. In the set of financial orders. So we're going anywhere. So one of the other things that we talk about when we think about the sidewalk equipment, and this isn't actually a question for either of you, this is kind of a general thing to consider. Um, you know, we, we talk about, are we willing to let sidewalks go snowier for longer? The other thing is how much snow we get has shifted a lot over the years and what is necessary now versus what was necessary five or 10 years ago, I think is is worth discussing. Um, I'm not a meteorologist, I'm not a climate expert, I'm not a DPW expert, far from it. Um, but I do think that that's part of this conversation is what the conditions haven't necessarily stayed the same over the years. Do our equipment needs need, need to stay the same over the years as well? Any comment? It's a rhetorical okay. question. Okay, thank you. It's something that was directed at the council, not right. at Paul or the uh, financial so I'm, Whoops, the screen just went off. Okay, I'm going to go to Andy because uh, both Mandy Joe and Kathy have already had an opportunity. Andy? Yeah, actually, it's a good time because I'm going to follow up on something that uh, Anna just raised, and that is some of the excess usually comes from unanticipated revenue. And uh, don't necessarily have to answer today if the information is not available, but it would be helpful at the Finance Committee to know the answer. And that is whether um, how much of it came from revenue and whether any of those revenue lines are attributable to revenue that we received because of education funding, uh, for example, Chapter 70. So um, if there was an increase in a line that was uh, education related, it would just be helpful to know that when we consider what's appropriate to do. I do, I do have those numbers, Andy. I, I can bring them to, I, I did those numbers already so I can bring them to the finance on Friday. Okay. We'll get them before the finance committee meeting. Um, 
I want to pick up on something Mandy Joe asked, uh, and that is about money for the charter review mm -hmm. committee. And that is, and I mean, would you like a motion that you prepare a financial order? No, we can we can bring that back uh, for your next for the the eighteenth, and we okay. go through the process. Right. We will be bringing some other um, financial orders for the enterprise funds. That, are, fine. So we'll time. include it at that because it is clearly something that they were discussing whether or not they could apply for a grant. Uh, okay. Is, yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. Back to Mandy Joe. Uh, Councillor Haneke, sorry. Um, a couple questions and a couple of requests. So my back of the envelope today was about 3 million came from excess revenues from what our budget was. Um, you're saying four, like I said, back of the envelope here. I I was doing it on the fly, but um, most of it looked like it was local receipts um, from my calculations. And so when we have local to, to sort of piggyback on what Anna was saying, when the excess free cash or the excess, the surplus is due to excess revenue due to conservative budgeting on local receipts, say, what is our obligation if we had budgeted less conservatively that additional number, um, local receipts looks like it was nearly 4 million more than our budget. 6.7 looked like the FY24 recap, 6.7 million in local receipts actuals was 10.9 million according to today's list. So $4 million more in local receipts. That includes all that awesome investment income. <laughs> um, but um, when it's 4 million more than we, than our budget, and that would have presumably been split even, it, it divvied up amongst the four um, core categories of general fund operating expenditures, that's a lot that would have gone to the, potentially gone to the region school, the elementary school, the library. Um, and I'm not saying we needed to figure out a way to budget all 4 million of that because we're never gonna be exact, but but when we're now looking at that surplus and distributing it out, I guess after six years on the council and seeing 4 million, 6 million, 5.5 million more every year in excess, in surplus revenue, at what point can we say it's not one-time money that, that you're saying? Because we're seeing it year after year after year. Um, it's not like one year we're at 4 million in surplus and the next year we're at 100,000 in surplus where it, we're sitting above 4 million every year, year in and year out. Um, at what point do we say distribute some of that within next year's budget or as we're looking at this, distribute and plan for it for next year. I know it's hard to distribute within this year's budget to those operating costs. So I think that's a conversation we need to have, um, but I'm struggling with that. And one thing that would help, this is where my request for when we see budgets come in, the chart you showed today and very generally all the charts we get show actuals once we have actuals, but we never see a budget to an actual. So we never get those two columns next to each other in a chart, except potentially in a quarter four report, which we haven't seen yet. So I would love a quarter four report that at least for general government for our town operating budget shows budget and actuals. But I would also love in reports like this that we get at the financial indicators and these spreadsheets that come in, not just to show the FY24 actual, but to show the FY24 recap and the FY24 actual so that we can see right off the bat in the large areas where those surpluses or deficits are coming from because we kind of lose track of 
where it is. And that might help us figure out whether it is conservative budgeting on the revenue side or um, on the def on the expense side, two million of it was from the town not spending its budget. Um, which bring brings me to another question, not necessarily for this, but for potentially finance as we think about all of this for budgeting next year. Um, our departments have been hit hard because of open positions. Mm -hmm. We budget for, and I'm just gonna give the fire department, I don't know how many positions it is, 56, 58 positions, I think the fire department is mm -hmm. budgeting for. Um, and that's all they can hire up to, except they almost never have a full complement of 58 firefighters because there's almost always empties, which means there's always less spending than budgeted because there's always an empty. And that not only gives us all these revenues, excess surpluses every year, but also harms our own staffing because they're constantly operating understaffed. And how do we, as we think about budgeting and financial guidelines going forward, how do we ensure that if we say the fire department should have 58 firefighters, that they have, 58 firefighters at all times, even though we know there's going to be turnover. And how do we do that within a budget that I understand good fiscal practice is to not say a staff can be 60, but you only budget for 58. I understand that's not very good fiscal practice, but how do we merge those two so that we don't underspend by 2 million and basically stress our staff out because we've underspent by 2 million. I know it's not really related to this. I do have a big question about waste hauling. You kind of answered it, but for finance on Friday, exactly what is it going to cover? Right. So on the fire, uh, it's a conversation I had today. It's a conversation we have weekly. Um, we budget, we would like the fire department to be fully staffed. There are not people out there applying for the job. They're doing everything they can. We're moving people off of, we're taking temporary employees off of the student force. Um, they have a lot of people out injured. Um, so there, it's a lot of stress on the department right now. Recognize, we recognize that. We hired, we hired two, I think a report this in the town manager report, we hired two recently. Um, if we'd hire more tomorrow, if we had candidates, there are no candidates, zero. And that's not unique to the town of Amherst, but we have a very, we have a good pipeline and it's like, put on your thinking caps. How can we fill up these seats? Because it really is stressful for the employees because we have a lot of people out on injuries, IOD or um, recovering from or paternity leave, or, you know, there are people who are just not present and able to fill shifts. So um we keep it budgeted at the full amount because that's what it's a, it might take multi years to get there, but we don't want to have to come back and say we're adding more money to the fire department budget in a year when we don't have money to add to it. It's much better to have it secure. Um, police have been the same. And now they're down two positions, but they I think we just fully got them up to speed with the most recent hires. So I think they're fully staffed at this point in time, but there will be more uh, churn going over there at, at some point in time. And we project out where retirement, when re, when retirements are coming, all that stuff. So the chiefs, the two chiefs are, are very active. They want those seats filled. We want them filled. There's no holding back on them um, because it's, it doesn't help anybody to have them held back. Um, in terms of the, you know, the additional columns, um, I don't think that's necessary. The financial indicators, it's financial indicators is really just a broad brush look at where we are. That's, but I think having the budget to actual, I understand what you're asking for. It's a really complicated, more detailed budget sheet, but people have to be willing to spend some time digging into it. I think the, um, you know, in terms of really knowing where the free cash is being generated from, I think that's where the, lots of the questions are. Are we being um, too conservative or too liberal on, on budgeting? So many of our expenses, and you know, we never predicted that we'd have twice as much in uh, revenue from um, interest, you know, and I don't know, I, you know, like I said, we don't know what next year is going to bring. So I wouldn't want to bump up the interest if we weren't really confident that rates were going to stay up for that. Um, but it's, you know, I think having more money is always better than having less. Um, but 
in how we allocate those funds. I don't think it's a good to put it into um, operating budgets because it is still one-time money. Um, but we do spend money on, you know, a lot of this money is going to the library, to the elementary school, um, uh, to roads that service everybody, to equipment that gets used by the schools, all that, all that type of thing. So there is a lot of shared expenses that, that gets funded by this as well. Um, it, we can't just look at what's on their side of the ledger because there's a lot of shared equipment as well. I make uh, one. Yes. I respond. So a lot of attention has been paid today to local receipts. And I just want to remind people that local receipts are the smallest revenue uh, bucket that we have. Um, well, except for other, which is obviously one time money. And um, in anticipation of these questions, I did do a 20 year history of revenues um, by category. And so what I have is that over the course of 20 years, um, local receipts have only grown 1.9%, but they fluctuate as much as 60% in any given year. So you can't predict them. And that's why we always, that's where why all the meat is in, in that revenue source, because the interest income, let's just use that as an example, because it's, it's, a, it's a huge outlier this year, right? So we, we were getting $150,000 two years ago we're now getting almost 2 million. You know, if we build that 2 million in, what happens when rates drop? Mm -hmm. Then then we're sitting here going, well, how do we maintain this budget? Right. So yes, it has big fluctuations and that's what, and we've done well for the past three years, it looks like, I mean, uh, obviously COVID was horrible. It was our worst dip. Was a, it was a 40% loss that year from the prior year. Um, but but it, it, it does fluctuate a great deal. And I want to remind people that it is the smallest revenue source we have and the least consistent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Kathy. I think Mandy already raised um, one of the things I thought that would help us see it, I believe we'll get fourth quarter um, this, seen this Friday, because that was very helpful last year, Holly, when we saw fourth quarter, you could see what came in way under or way over. And my memory is two big lines were the investment income that you, uh, that we had, we had big reserves and we got interest payments on them, but Mandy flagged a couple of things. So am I right that we'll, we'll get fourth quarter so we can look at that, uh, what I think is a very useful compilation. It's just a one year worth, but it does show you where we thought we were gonna be, which is when we close the year out. Yes, I am working on the fourth quarter report. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, George. Yeah, I'd like to just put in a word for in defense of fiscal prudence and conservative budgeting and a reminder uh, to all of us the historical context. Um, when I came on this council six years ago for my first term, this one of the central uh, goals and one of our key objectives were the four capital projects. And uh, as we know, those four capital projects are still, shall we say, in process. Um, there's a history here. And um, if we didn't have four capital projects, if we didn't have a middle, middle school roof that's leaking, if we didn't have a senior center that's not performing, providing the functions it should, if we didn't have a huge backlog of roads and sidewalks, we didn't have these kinds of capital pressures, we might be in a very different conversation, but we do. So I hope people will keep that historical context in mind and that there actually is a very good reason for the fiscal prudence and conservative approach that's been followed for the last few years. And at least at the moment, I think we should continue to follow. Nonetheless, good questions have been raised tonight and I look forward to hearing what happens at FinCom and what the conversation becomes going forward. But please, let's keep in mind historical context. Thank you, George. <laughs> Having believed that we need to not lose sight of it. 
Uh, I also want to mention that at our meeting on the 18th, it is, we have every intention of having an update of the fiscal model for the capital projects, which will help people refresh their memory on the purpose of having those reserves so that you even out the borrowing float that we often need. And I'm, I have this vision of that chart and that graph in my mind. And I know that in the early years, it was necessary for us to have additional cash in order to not exceed our borrowing capacity. So that's one of the things we'll wait to see when we see the model. But I have a question that relates specifically to money that we are have received as grants. And we're sitting on that money and we've invested that money and we've made money on that money through interest. Does that money that we made on grant money have to be spent for the purpose that the grant was given? Depends on the grant. Thank you. But it, so, we, so some grants specify that the interest income stays with the grant. Right. Um, a lot of our grants, though, are reimbursable. So we're fronting the money. Right. So, um, but we are, um, you know, and for our reserves, I mean, you should recognize that the capital stabilization, the stabilization account, those that interest stays with those funds, um, unlike the free cash, which will, we have, you know, $5 million dollars roughly a free cash to start the year at the beginning of this year. And then, um, you know, we'll reset that again, that that goes to the general fund uh, interest income. I do want to compliment us on such good investments, though. Nothing like making a little money while you're sitting on it. Um, so you've answered that question. And I specifically raised that because I know, for example, we've received in advance money for the library. And that's part of what we've been able to invest. Correct. And the library money stays with the library. Thank you. That's useful information right there. Um, thank you. Uh, let's see, George. No, I, I Bob, thank you. Um, I have um, to change glasses, sorry. I, I think uh, this Friday's meeting of the Finance Committee is going to be an interesting one. Um, I think there's a lot of important issues have been raised, and I think we should have a very vigorous um, debate or discussion. Um, I do want to just caution people that if we take free cash and put it into operations, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but the unintended consequence will be that people will, operations will hire more people, which then creates a demand going forward that you have to feed because you've made a long-term commitment to these people. So we, we need to be thoughtful about what our goals are if we were to move money into operations. Is it to hire more staff? Is it to do other kinds of things? So just, you know, I, I just want to caution people that it, 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 there could be unintended consequences for doing so. I, I think it's a great thing to talk about, though. Um, Councillor Haneke, you have your hand up. Um, thank you. Sorry. Lots of questions. Um, these might be my last ones for tonight, and they're in preparation for Friday. Um, there are specific capital projects on this beyond just sending to capital stabilization. In fact, three roads and sidewalks for a million, a uh, hundred and some thousand for the waste hauler bylaw, and then this sidewalk plow. And we've touched a little bit on each of them, but I would like on Friday a better explanation as to how you came to these. I mean, I, I could probably give that explanation myself, <laughs> but versus did you talk to, who did you talk to to get to these and how did you make this decision? For example, you know, when we have a JCPC process that goes through sorts of things had nixed the sidewalk plow and I know there might be new things, but there were other things they nixed or things that they said, if there is more money, give it to this one. Did you go back to that report? Did you not, did you talk to our superintendent of schools to see if there were emerging cap need that might be more useful for 200,000 than a sidewalk plow, for example? What about the library? Things like that. Come, uh, for Friday, please please come in uh, with the I, conversation I it, or, yeah, or tonight. Fine. And then uh, one of the things I kept thinking of as I saw all these 
allocations to the capital program essentially was, um, you know, in our annual budget, we've put 10 and a half percent or 10.2 percent, I think it is this year or last year, to capital. And then every year we seem to be allocating more to capital without more to um, operating in that sense. And so could we get a better percentage number that how, how do these allocations go into that? Do they ever go into that budget to determine what our actual capital spending per hour Oper uh, per our total budget is our total budget was 97 million, I believe, for FY24 that we just closed out. And if we're putting and the next one's 98 million, our FY25 budget's around 98 million. Um, 90, yeah, 98. Um, and a certain amount of that is capital, of that is um, eight. Not eight million is capital, um, but then we're adding a million plus onto that for capital. Do can we get historical numbers that show total capital spending minus the debt exclusion um, that include these one-off capital allocations, so that we get a better understanding as to how much of our total budget every year is being spent on capital when our financial goal is 10 and a half. Sure. So, you know, it's a policy decision how much you want to allocate to capital versus operating. That's a that that's something the finance committee can discuss and review it and submit it to the town council. If you want to do less for capital and more for operating, that's a that's a policy decision. Um, in terms of the why capital now, um, we, I try to drive everything, all all budgetary decisions through the normal budget process that happens beginning now, but in, through the JCPC process and then uh, through the budget process. I don't want to have two different budget cycles. It's just too much work. And, it's, and we already have another budget cycle with CPA going and CDBG. There's there's just too much. What, what rises to the top is um, there at the, what you see are three different examples. So one is a council initiative, which was the waste hauler. Uh, the council said, we want to do this and, and, and we want money to do it. And so if you want, we said, if you want to do it, here's how you do it. And it's like council said, we want that. So that's a, that's a high priority then council initiative. The second is, you know, I think what I interpret to be a council initiative or capital need is roads. And we always, we try, if there is extra money, we put it to roads. And that's sort of a thing we've done the last few years. And the council has been receptive to that. Uh, and then the other, the other thing is if there are uh, emergent expenses, not just something I didn't get last time, so I'm bringing it forth again. Something happened, so we need it. There, and I have had the conversation with the superintendent say, would you have things that were unexpected? And we talked about a couple things that might work for her. Um, but she, we, you know, we haven't had a really forceful conversation about timing and things like that. When she would have to get it, so she's away this week. But when she gets back, we'll say, are there, are there other opportunities? Because I recognize that some people say, wait a minute, you get free cash and you just give it to the town side. I don't believe that that's what we're doing because these things all benefit everybody else. But, um, but we, but we don't do an open solicitation to all the departments. Say, hey, we've got money. Go. Spend what do you want? There's very specific things. You know, I think roads always stands out by itself. Um, and then because we do have un seems like unlimited capital needs. You see, when you go through JCPC, you see, you don't see the half of what people really want. They just don't bring it to you because they, they don't think they're going to get it. Okay. Are we completed with this discussion? Well, tonight. We're not even remotely completed with this discussion. And I believe finance committee is Friday at Friday at nine. Okay. Um, and that means that cup of Joe will only be an hour. Well, Melissa will come over to finance. I'll, we'll, I'll clean up at cup I of Joe. Okay. He's yeah. going to clean up. Um, I'm sorry. It's, it's that hour of the night. Um, I would like to move on to committee and liaison reports. Um, Community CRC, Pam Rooney. 
Thank you. I think uh, the one important CRC announcement is that um, we were not able to get published our public hearing for the University Drive overlay. So that hearing will not be on November 12th and uh, not enough time um, to also publish it for the 19th. So we need to regroup and determine when we will hold the public hearing for you drive overlay. This is just something that just came up and Anyway, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, elementary school building. Any, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mandy Jo. Um, how does that affect the legality of it if we miss the 65 day deadline for Holt starting the public hearing? I'd have to check. I think we need to schedule the, we need to open the public hearing before Thanksgiving, but I don't remember the date. So it's like the 23rd, 26th, 24th, some, somewhere in the 20s. So Pam and I just spoke at the meeting tonight and, um, you know, we didn't settle on anything because CRC needs to talk about it or she needs to ask CRC members um, to see if we can find a date before the deadline okay. that we can notice it in time. To at least open the hearing. To yeah. open it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, elementary school building. Okay. I have nothing to report, and Paul's report, he noticed we're, we're on hold right now right. after a very long hearing last week. Four and a half hours. Uh, Finance Committee, Bob Hagner. Uh, nothing new. We'll, as, a, as I said earlier, we're meeting on Friday and we're right. going to have a long meeting. Uh, GOL, Anna. Oh, I'm sorry. Question. Will that... What's on the agenda for what's on the intended agenda and when will financial guideline discussions be coming to finance? Uh, we have uh, an initial discussion of the financial guidelines, I believe, will be on the agenda. As well as the Just, as, and, as well as what else? Well, no, <laughs> I mean, we're gonna, the agenda. We're obviously talk about the financial indicators and we're going to talk about the the um, allocations. Thanks. Did, the free cash allocation. Did I see a email that outlined all that i think as to which dates were going to be when yeah, yeah something like that no oh, maybe uh okay got it thank you but it probably it probably hasn't been posted yet so it'd be good to post it no yeah. no okay any other questions for those moving on to anna GOL. All right. So GOL is meeting on Thursday and we will be discussing uh, the town manager goals as well as we have two proclamations, um, one for small business Saturday and one for the human rights day. If you'd like to sponsor those, I've got uh, two responses for small business Saturday, but seeking sponsors for human rights day. Um, and if anyone else wants to sponsor small business Saturday, you were already on it at two additional ones who yeah. I did not see that, but which Good. one? Anyway, great. Um, I will add you. So those are on our agenda for Thursday. Um, and as a reminder, I'm going to send out right now a Word document version of the grid that was in our packet from the last meeting, if folks would like that. Um, but I need your feedback on, again, we're talking about the goal areas for the town manager goals. So that, that column that says uh, climate action, blah, 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 blah. Um, I need your feedback on that now. Um, so if you'd liked any changes or if you have any comments on that, if you have comments on the rest of it, send that to me too. But right now I'm really seeking that, that first column area. Uh, and I think, and, and so because that is currently kind of front burner, we have not forgotten about the AHRA successor body, um, or the legislative process guide, but we're prioritizing these things for, for this upcoming meeting. Uh, any questions? TSO, Andy? Yes, um, I sent a report of our last meeting and the uh, summary of questions that we received from various sources uh, regarding, including the council uh, regarding Southeast Street. And, and it, uh, 
advance of this meeting. It's in, in the packet. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll respond or uh, another member of the committee can respond. Um, as far as the meeting this Thursday, um, the agenda, th there's one, I understand one town manager appointment we may have, um, but the major discussion is gonna start with the proposed roundabout at Amity Street and University Drive because of the funds that were received from the state um, that's putting that uh, referral, which had been put on hold for a long period of time until we had funding for it, into a higher uh, priority. And we've been asked to move that more quickly so that that is on the agenda. Um, it's we, are, we did reserve the opportunity to talk about Southeast Street, but I don't think we're really going to talk about the substance. What we're going to talk about is the... Uh, date for the meeting and the logistics for the meeting um, that we're going to have. And we'll make sure that that's well publicized. And uh, then the um, council president will have to decide if there's uh, going to be significant participation from a number of councilors, uh, whether it needs to be posted as a council meeting. That's not my call as chair of the committee. Um, the other things that are on the agenda um, is school safety zones. And uh, I understand that Jason Skeels is working on a plan that he thinks is doable for um, the high school. And uh, that was what the purpose of the referral was. Um, and that's on the agenda because we've been advised that there's a significant likelihood that there'll be a plan ready to present to us um, on Thursday, so it's it's on it's on the agenda, so that if the plan is it there to present, um, it's posted appropriately, and we can actually uh, do that. And uh, we have been putting proposed transportation and parking commission charge and amendments to the town council policy on every agenda because we're trying to uh, work through a series of issues and. Uh, if time permits, we will be going on to the next section as discussed in our last report. So barring questions, that's it. Councilor Haneke. Uh, again, I'm looking at this versus that. Kathy? That's okay. I even blurred my background so the little hand sticks out more now. <laughs> Everyone else gets a bright yellow one. Um, Andy, my question is, um, have... Do you know whether the proposed plan and the questions have reached the teachers, the crossing guard, the custodians, the people who now manage the off-site traffic for the school to have input? Um, I got a request from school committee members to send the questions that you generated. They were worried decisions that had already been made. So I don't know whether there's been an actual meeting with the people at the schools. They ha they will have a lot to say about what they now do to try to get the kids across the roads and particularly the really busy south intersection with the double road crossing. I just wanna make sure it's not just TAC, but it's also the school itself, the people who are, are um, doing it. The crossing guards go out and stop the traffic right now too and walk the kids across, you know, walk the kids across because it's not that easy with discontinuous sidewalks. So that's a question. They were worried that decisions had already been made and I said not to worry about that. Uh, and um, yes, I, uh, this is a first step. It's not the only step. And so I assume that we are going to have a separate um, outreach not just to the schools, but to the people who, who's particularly the current Fort River staff, because they have the most experience with the area, um, but uh, also to the general public um, that uh, we um, are very concerned that there be a significant um, community input section to the discussion, but um, we also recognize that there are a lot of questions that are already out there 
and they're now been forwarded to the town manager and the superintendent of public works. Um, and if the uh, plan gets modified as a result, that would be the more useful uh, plan than to reach to the next group of uh, people. So the answer is, uh, to has is this okay. a done deal? No. No. So so I understand that. I just I have a, a bit of frustration about this because we tried to get this conversation started two years ago and really get DPW working on it, and there was a long delay, a uh, really long delay before getting someone. Uh, expert to look at it, um, and I'm not sure why the, except that the state wanted to fund the roundabout that's on University Drive, this seems like a fairly urgent problem that's not going to be solved when the school opens, but at least we could be solving it with a lot of input. I mean, people were really caught by surprise by what came to us as the proposed. Um, so, and there were conversations with the design team and the traffic people on options that DPW was part of early on on the off site. And then the town said, we'll take care of that. And it's just, there's been a long wait. So I just would like to expedite and involve people as quickly as possible, rather than say, we've got a long series of steps that might take a year. Um, I'd rather get input and think of potential redesigns. Thanks. And I'm not putting it on your thing. I'm saying the frustration precedes us getting this report by quite a few years. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your input. And uh, you really were are speaking to the entire committee since I think everybody's here. Um, so um, that will be helpful for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haneke. Um, on the school safety zones, just one request to make sure that whatever map DPW produces uh, includes the middle school. Presumably it will, since about the only entrance to the middle school is also the high school entrance. So, But just make sure that we don't forget that the request was for both schools and that the signage on that map that is produced should include all the signs for both schools. Councilor uh, Anna. Um, okay, two things. The first is this is going to sound like semantics, um, but they are just called school zones. And I, I say that because safety zones have a whole different set of procedural requirements, and I don't want us to get confused or confuse the public. And so I would ask TSO in your discussion of this, please call them school zones. Um, that's what we voted to, to create. Um, and I, again, I don't want the public to get confused and say, why aren't you doing an engineering study? Why aren't you doing a speed study? Because those are not required for establishing a school zone. So that is my request to TSO um, in your discussion of this topic. And then the second question I had was in the um, report, it talked about reaching out to the safe routes uh, uh, to schools people. And I'm trying to figure out who that is, because I know that it's a state program. And I know that there's organization locally from volunteers, but I'm, and I, and that is not to say we shouldn't talk to whoever's engaged with that work, but I'm trying to figure out who those folks are because um, this is a group that we want to engage on other things as well. And so I'm curious kind of how they come together, how they're vetted um, for being the experts on this topic. Uh, I know that they're big advocates for this topic and that's a really important role to play, but that's also different than our transportation advisory committee who are advocates, but are, are there because they also bring expertise. And so I, again, I'm not discounting talking to Safe Routes to Schools folks, but I'm curious if you're talking to the folks who are local advocates for the program, or if you're talking to the state um, organizers of the program. Both are great. Just curious which one. Alan, well, you don't have to answer. I think you'd find out. Councillor Haneke, do you have your hand up? Yep. Yeah. okay. Um, we're, are there any liaison reports? Her, uh, Jennifer. Yes, just very briefly, the Council on Aging. Um, I think you all received a notice from the, uh, Haley um, at the uh, du Executive Director of the Senior Center of the Clause for a Cause program. Mm -hmm. And if you could get that word out to your constituents, that would be terrific. They would appreciate that. That's donations for holiday gifts and possibly volunteers to deliver them as well. Thank you. Um, 
town manager's report, Paul. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump through a few things. One is um, Cup of Joe is on Friday and it starts at eight, I think, and then we'll I'll be there to nine thirty. Melissa will leave at nine to go to the finance committee meeting. Um, Farmers Market is exploring a winter market that will be at the Banks Community Center during the month of on Saturdays from ten to two during the month of December, and then every other Saturday during January, February. We're working out some of the details, but it seems like that's going to be a go. Um, tomorrow is election day. Uh, town clerk is really in good shape. Uh, we've got everything, every, every slot filled. Um, we have safety plans in, in place. Just, we don't know what's going to happen. It's a very volatile election. So, uh, everybody's on board. Hopefully it will go smoothly. Um, we've put out a notice that there's a ban on fires because there's been a lot of brush fires and maybe people are smelling it and uh it's happening our crews have been over helping northampton with a major brush fire the last three days um so it's real and we don't see any rain coming up uh next um monday is the veterans day at nine o'clock breakfast uh, 11 o'clock is uh the flag raising ceremony on the north common so you're welcome to that uh, um let's see the schools, uh, as mentioned, we had a four and a half hour hearing on the bid protest. All the written material had to be submitted to the attorney general by last Friday. They, it's now in their court to make a decision. Um, and they have, it's not a, it's more of an advisory decision on what they, how they read the situation and we'll listen, read what they have to say and go from there. Um, the, uh, library, I did want, want to spend a minute on that. So our bids, our bid, one bid of two came in below our target number. Um, so the, the bid came in at, um, and, and with, we were able, with the bid, we were able to increase our contingency from 1.86 million to 3.43 million. Um, this number will, will includes all construction and contingency and paid and anticipated money. And it, the, and with it, the number being below the appropriation that's been already approved by the town council. Uh, the next steps for us is we still are going through the section 106 review, which will take some time. Um, and we also are looking at procuring space uh, to relocate the library during the, the course of the construction. Um, and we're st still on, we're looking forward and hoping that we can start the construction in 2025. And what I'm going to do is put together, we sort of have a draft of a spreadsheet that shows all these numbers that I will share, share out with the council. We'll get into this a lot more detail at the, um, at the Jones Library Building Committee meeting, which I think meets November 18th or something like that. So, um, and the other thing we have to do is make sure we have our OPM on board. Um, and Yes, and that's pretty much it. Those are the tasks in front of us at this point in time, as yeah. beyond reviewing the bid and all that kind of stuff. Okay, questions of the town manager, Kathy? Yes, and I sent some in advance, so I know you're working on them. Um, I'm I'm concerned that the the low bid is also the same contractor who's trying to knock out the two other contractors on the school. And I don't know whether people have noticed that, and that I think on the school, they have a really healthy margin um, because they could take advantage of some sub bids that wouldn't work with one of the other contractors. So I'm a little worried that they may have lowballed their bid in the anticipation that they can do changes later because this is $6 million below what they bid before. It's the same break. So I want to be really careful that we have a lot of oversight, Paul. So I'm not sure who who or what the OPM team would be if we move forward on uh, avoiding what I understand happened in the 1993. There wasn't a lot of oversight um, on, I wanna make sure if it gets built, that it gets built well. Then I also will appreciate when you and Bob come to us with um, something that talks about the budget that adds to the 446.1, because the last time I saw one was November, of 2023, and um, some of that money has already been spent, and I know that, but I don't know. I don't. I'd like to see a good estimate of what contingency is now really in, because this the contract bid only came in a couple hundred thousand 
below the target. So it wasn't like with the schools where it was millions. So I, I know that was good news. So I just like to see it put together in a way that mirrors the way we're getting to see the school budget regularly with the different pieces on what it was four months ago, what it is now with our best estimates. And, and I know there's one sub bid, you said that we're just still waiting on electric before the whole package is done. I'm not sure I completely understand how we can still be at a sub bid level because with the school, when we had to redo a sub bid, we pushed the whole bidding process off for the general contractor, but it seems like we can do it after the fact for the other bid. So I've only been through two processes, one process before this. It just seems different because we postponed the whole general contractor bid when we had to redo electric bid on the school. So it, these are questions. Yeah. So with the subcontractor bid, what we told the general contractors to do is carry an allow a specified allowance. We said everybody's going to be playing by the same number for the electrical bid, and then we will get the sub bids for the electrical. So that's how we we're able to accommodate that because there was a, a an issue with the electrical bid that one of the bidders picked up, and so we had been, and this happens during the bidding process. Not not a surprise. Um, but so everybody, the money is in uh, a, a sum is allocated into the budget um, for electrical work, uh, and every bidder has carried the same number in it, so it's sort of held harmless for that. Um, so I think our contingency, they, we treat the contingency differently, and Bob can explain this to you more. Um, the, at the um, school, they had contingencies at multiple levels. This has just one contingency. We don't have an architecture contingency or other contingencies. Um, and our contingency now is about 9.59%, which is $3.43 million. Um, you know, there's there's a long way to go. The other piece of this is also just the financing plan. You know, are we going to have, a, I can't sign a contract unless I know we're going to have enough money to build this project. We know we've got the town appropriation. We know we've got the MBLC money and I need to have confirmation from the, or confidence from the um, trustees that they're, they're going to come up with their share of money. It's interesting talking to um, people at the university today who were like uh, on bid chat on bid uh, challenges and they said like welcome to every bid we deal with there's challenges up and down everybody's challenging everybody else's bid right now so it's very competitive that way i think um so i'll try get any, any other questions just pass them along no, I, I didn't ask about the financing but that yeah. that's the one once i see what sure. the budget is do we have the money you know right. on because there's a gap and uh Right now, the town will be on the hook for it. Yeah. Right. So that's that we have to account. I think there's a, about a seven million dollar gap right now, and that's where um, we have to have a pretty clear plan about how how that's going to be filled. Yeah. Uh, Bob Hegner. Yeah, I, I had the same question uh, regarding the the funds available funding, and also um, I just want to make sure that we protect the town against unnecessary risks when we put together any sort of final package. Um, and I, I mean, if you're doing a renovation, you not start knocking down walls, you always come up with something unexpected. And so uh, whether the contingency that's in the budget is sufficient for that, I don't know. And if we overrun, you know, is the town on the hook for that money? Is the library, are the library trustees on the hook for that money? It would be helpful to have that spelled out. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, Anna. Um, I, where was it? Oh, no, I lost it. Okay, here it is. Um, I was, sorry, I was scrolling down in the report and now I have to find it again. Oh, page one. Um, this is actually a question for Athena. Um, your presenting to the MMA on November 16th. Um, is that going to be streamed or recorded in any way if we can't go in person to that? The Counselors Association um, meeting was canceled due to lack of uh, low registration numbers. Ah. Well, that was a, a <laughs> womp womp. <laughs> Thank you for the update. <laughs> Take that one off your calendar. Uh, thanks for the question, Anna. Uh, Pam. Thank you. Um, back to the library for a minute. So um, you 
somebody just mentioned the seven million dollar gap. Um, we we still don't know what the results of Section One Hundred Six mm -hmm. Historic Review is going to be. I hope I hope it does not affect the NEH and the HUD grants that that are again another two million dollars worth. Um, do you have a plan to to cover nine million dollars if that's if that adds to the gap with the two million dollars if we somehow don't procure those grants um, and then the contingency or the, the the slightly lower bids that we got that were that came in a little under the under the estimate has been added to the contingency is that contingency going to cover are you expecting that that contingency will cover all of the um the NEH and the HUD grant uh, requirements for Section 106. Um, if they if they're asking for changes to be made or um, averting the I'm trying to remember what the term is the adverse effects on the library, that contingency is is going to have to cover that as well. Question. Yeah, I don't. I can't predict what the 106 review will 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 will. Will require or recommend um, the. I don't think they can require anything. They they make they make, give advice to the um, funding agencies, which is the NEH, the other the federal grants, and then. Um, but that process, one hundred and six review, is going to go through a process, and we have to see how that plays plays out. Um, in terms of, um, you know, I can't predict where the contingency is going to be en enough. You always would like more. Um, just like with the schools, we always would like more, um, but it, 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 we only have the amount of money that we have. Um, in terms of, you know, I think the financing plan it has, you know, the, the the funding stack is pretty complicated because it has, you know, town funds, it has uh, the MBLC grant, it's got, you know, federal grants, it's got lots of fundraising. So I'm hoping that the um, trustees uh, will be very successful in, as they continue to fundraise now that we've got a, a really solid bid in from a very, very reputable company. Okay. Jennifer? Um, <clears throat> uh, Pam asked most of my questions, but I, I just did want some clarification. So we have the contingency, but since we don't know, you know what they're going to find as they start to do the renovation and demolition can it be negotiated into a contract that beyond a certain point, the contractor, you know, that to limit the change orders that they would have to just assume those costs or would the library take that on? Um, because the library trust, the president of the trustees had said during, I think the last building committee meeting that he anticipated change orders, but you know, that we, <laughs> we don't have deep pockets. So we only have the money that we have. So unless we, I can't assign a contract that's more than the amount of money that we have. Um, and we can't borrow more than, they, than the council has appropriated. So- um, But don't change orders come after the contract's signed? Yes, yes, they can come after. Would we do- You say yes or no to a change order. That's, the, that's always the question. Okay. <laughs> Um, George. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Sam. You still have your hand up. <laughs> sorry. Let me let me get the right right mic. Sound like God. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I have a deep voice, but um, yeah. I just. I, first of all, I guess I want to start with um, the concern about. Um, the funding sources and the raising of the money for the capital campaign. I happen to be a member of that body, and I have every confidence, and we have every confidence, that we can meet our campaign goals. Um, this group has already raised over $7 million. Um, I also would point out that at the moment, um, at least for the last couple months, there was a real question about whether this project could proceed and now we know that it can. Um, to expect people to be giving substantial sums of money in that period 
is, is wildly unrealistic, and I think people know that. So we have every confidence that we can meet those goals. Um, I want to go back to a document I have in front of me, um, which is the uh, Memorandum of Agreement that comes from November of 23. And I just would like some clarification um, because perhaps I'm the one who's, who's confused. But in that document that was signed by the trustees and by the town, it states the library intends to raise the new library share, which is $13,822,518 by applying for grants available to it, whether government or private, and through gifts to it from individuals or other sources and further has agreed that if the new library share is not obtained through such sources, the library shall use either the library's endowment or other sources of funds available to it, which may include taking out a bank loan to pay the new library share. Item 11 says the library also understands the town will not pay more than its town share committed by this agreement and the previous agreements. So I read that as a fairly clear statement that the risk that uh, some people have been alluding to and seem to be deeply concerned about um, uh, is actually covered in this agreement. Um, the library understands fully that the town share is what it is and it's not going to change. Um, and that's why this recent new bid is, is so important because it shows that this can be done uh, according to the, the original budget that we, according to the budget that we have. So Paul, I guess I need your uh, clarification that, that that seems to state that the risks that um, these are being raised here are actually on the shoulders of the library trustees um, and the library. And if you have concerns about those risks and questions about this project, you should be addressing them to the library trustees and to the billing committee. They're the ones who are responsible. They're the ones who are facing the risk. Um, so, Paul, am I not correct that this document is the governing document and that it says that the risks that uh, might arise over the next few months or year, whatever, is actually something that is on the shoulders of the library trustees. So, so that you're right, that that document controls the amount of money that the town uh, is willing to put into this project. Uh, the bid controls the amount of money it's gonna cost to complete this project based on the bid specs that were issued. Um, and the trustees have taken on the responsibility of, of doing the rest. And that's why, but I think it's important for us to know what's that strategy and how they're going to get there when it comes time to sign the contract. So we know we have confidence that when the bills, that the money is going to be available when we need the money to, to pay. So I think the trustees are fully aware of that and prepared for that. Councillor Haneke. I'm going to use that MOU to segue to something else. I'm sure people will come back to the library. I was listening to a school committee meeting the other day, um, a regional school committee meeting, and a topic came up that involves the town of Amherst. So I'd like to hear from you about that. Um, the superintendent was talking about working on memorandums of understandings with Amherst Rec and Amherst DPW on various things. So can you talk about that matter from your perspective and what's going on and what they might look like and all of that. Yes, yeah, so um, there's a little bit, um, the superintendent came in hit with fresh eyes and starts to look at the relationship between the town and the, the district and what services, uh, when there were needs from the, the things that had been more of a handshake agreement previously, we're now um, saying we should reduce this to writing. This goes back to when Ron Bohanowitz was the shared facilities director of both the town and the uh, schools, and he sort of managed everything as one big event. So he would have an electrician from the school come and work on something at the town hall and vice versa. So because he had he just looked at it as one big thing, and it sort of flowed pretty well. Um, Melissa has now taken on the responsibility, and I think that at, at the um, agreement with the superintendent that we should actually write these things down. You know, we take care of their football field. They take care of the track. Uh, they take take care of this. We take care of their swimming pool, but they own the swimming pool. Um, we we use the swimming pool. What do we get charged for? When can we use their facilities? You know, we work together, but sort of reducing things to writing will help clarify and identify who's sharing the burden on these things. There's a lot of, it, it's, there's a lot of informal stuff. Can you come and fill some potholes on our parking lot? DPW runs over and just does it in a heartbeat. Uh, they don't charge them for that or anything like that. We'd like there to be that con continued, but we also 
feel that both sides, I think, feel that it's probably good to sort of identify and quantify what this relationship is costing each other. Thank you. I've been pushing for those quantifications for, I don't know, five years, six years now. So um, I, has, I'm, thrilled to, I'm thrilled to see it. Um, are these, um, it, I think, since they would be intermunicipal agreements that you would have to come to us to seek permission to sign them. Is that correct? Right, right. So between, we would see them before they get signed? Yeah, the, the, for, between, the, between the, dist, the regional school district and the, um, and the town, yes. Thank you. Um, George, you still have your hand up. I'm gonna go to Andy. Yeah, I'll return to the library, but I'll be really quick. Um, I think that uh, one additional thing we need fairly soon in the process is kind of an updated thorough assessment of what would happen if we can't move forward with the project for expansion and renovation and we have to go into a repair option as to what that's going to cost and what years it's going to, um, those monies are going to have to come from, where they might come from, um, that kind of thing, because I think that it's important for the council to know that as we talk about it, but I think it's also very important for the community to understand that. So, there are no decisions for the council to make. We've got the appropriation, we've got the bid, we move forward. Um, the council, every elected body that has voted on this have voted generally by two thirds or more vote. The, the general populace has voted on us by two thirds vote. The things that I identified tonight, like you know, getting through 106 review and all these other things and having the OPM on board and doing the procurement of space and all those things are still tasks ahead of us. This project is moving forward. The intent is to move the project forward. That's the, what the council voted to do. Uh, I know there are a lot of people or a small group of people out there who are agitating to make this project fail. I think that that's um, unfortunate because it's been clear. I take my, my direction from the council. The council voted it by two thirds vote. So, uh, you know, in terms of the, the getting an alternative, I think that's not well time spent and we don't really have people to do that right now. Um, it would be, you know, we'd have to have Bob Parent get off of the school project or the library project. They're both taking enormous amounts of time right now. So um, at this moment in time, I don't intend to have anybody work on that um, because I, if this, if we don't make it through, I don't see what would prevent us from making it through at this point in time um, because we have a successful bidder who's a reputable bidder. Are there any other questions of the town manager? Seeing none, um, I'm going to just quickly move to, um, let me just pull up something. I just want to remind people that our meeting on the 18th begins at 5. Uh, if you are not going to be here, and meaning you'll be at some other location, at 5 o'clock we will email you the documents. Um, that you are to read. Um, you did receive all of the documents now that are input from other people um, as of, I think, about 4.30 this afternoon. And please make absolutely every effort, every effort, to make sure I have your written valuation no later than Wednesday, November 13th at 4 o'clock. Um, next... On the next council meeting, I've mentioned already the two different public forums. In addition to that, we will have a presentation on the capital financial model updated. Uh, if there's anything to report on town manager goals, uh, we'll have that, um, although I'm not prom promising anything. Uh, we expect uh, finance committee to come back with actions, recommended actions, to the extent possible on the referrals we did tonight. Um, we may be actually looking at the CPA appropriation for the track and field, uh, and also some DPW appropriations from the various enterprise funds. 
and also another appropriation that we asked for tonight, which is regard to the Charter Review Committee. Um, are there any counselor comments at this time? May I make a quick request regarding the next meeting? We, this is the meeting that the, the town provides dinner for counselors. We'll have pizza there. Um, if there are any dietary restrictions, please let us know. And then um, we, we usually print copies of the evaluations. It's a lot of paper. So if anyone would like a printed copy, please let us know. Otherwise, you'll get everything electronically. If anyone won't be attending in person and you'd like a printed copy, we don't release them until right when the meeting begins. So I need to know that in advance. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Uh, Alicia. Thank you. Is this the portion where I can say my un um, like unanticipated comments, topics? This is the portion where you as a counselor have made, made comments, please. Okay, great. Um, I am actually just wondering what is the approval process for, for the moving of a house? Nice question. I think Paul's had some um, practice answering this one. So a person who wants to move the house can move the house under state law and the utilities have to accommodate them and bear the cost of making the moving the wires and things like that. Um, they, they, we charge them for uh, costs that the town incurs, but we don't get to say yes or no, they can't move it or they can move it. Uh, I think you're referencing a house move that was very recent, which turned out not to be a very successful um, uh, move. Uh, and it leaked into the um, school day, which which disrupted many of people in the, at the Fort River School specifically, um, and created a lot of havoc uh, with traffic and with people losing power. Um, you know, I think we are directing people who have lost power or lost food because of losing power to EverSource, uh, who is responsible for the for delivering electricity to people's houses. Um, you know lesson learned on this one going forward as well from the town's point of view. Um, thank you. Sorry, just a couple of follow-up questions. So can we, I know you're saying we don't have much control over it, but are there any restrictions we can put in place like what days of the week this can happen? Yeah, you know, I, I started looking today around to see if there's a, if any towns have sort of regulations on this that we can say you need a permit to do this or anything like that. I haven't found anything yet. Um, usually movers want to be, they want to comply. And I think looking again, one of the lessons learned is this is we chose, or they chose, we all chose a bad day to move it. Um, it would have been easier for them to move it on whether the day before a holiday or something like that. So, um, there's that's always a conversation between the mover the developer and the mover and usually with the police department in the town additional questions Alicia? okay no just a last comment i do think that that would be really helpful in the future if the town does have any say for the town to advocate on behalf of the residents to have that happen like yeah. like you said on a day before a holiday or even on a weekend um because my kids couldn't go to school that day we live we go to fort river we live off of old Belchertown Road. Everything was shut down. The school buses couldn't make it to us. I had to call out of work. I had to miss a presentation for school. It was like a very big deal for our family. We also had no power all night long and my kids are afraid of the dark. So it was a very difficult night with my kids up all night. Um, and so like, I just think it was absolutely ridiculous and that there could have been better advocacy and planning because the schools didn't even send out a message to let families know that they wouldn't be able to accommodate students until 8.23 when school starts at 8 a.m. Uh, any other comments, Councillor Walker? No, that's it. I just think it's really important to be said. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Mm -hmm. And I, there's others that's totally hear you. Um, are there any other comments? If not, I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn. Seek a second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Haneke. Hi. Bob Hegner. Hi. Councillor Lord. Hi. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Hi. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Hi. Jennifer Taub. 
Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous. The meeting is adjourned at 1034.